What's up, pals? Pete from the Comics Pals here to let you guys know about a little technical issue we had this week. Uh, we've decided in 2018 we want to start doing a video version of the show for YouTube, and we did our first uh, run at that this week, and uh, unfortunately, due to a technical issue on my end, uh, the video was corrupted, and we unfortunately lost that footage. So the episode's going to go up as normal. Uh, we make a few references to the fact that it's a video episode on YouTube, even though it's not. So, sorry for that. Um, we think we've got the problem all figured out. We're going to take one more week just to troubleshoot it next week while Sean and Phil are away. And make sure we have all the kinks worked out for you guys when we come back with the whole group in two weeks. So, that's two weeks from now. You'll have uh, the official video version of the show available on YouTube every week. Until then, it'll be business as usual. So, uh, sorry again for the mix-up, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Thank you. You are listening to episode 65 of the Comics Pals. We're a group of comic book journalists and friends who record a podcast together because we don't talk enough about comics in our daily lives. This weekend, the United States government shut down, and I can't help but feel responsible because we elected the man who's responsible, Wilson Fisk. <laughs> the president of the United States. You know, Phil, all the other candidates lack vision. He did. <sighs> <laughs> uh, global destruction is a great vision Thank you very much He's got goals The other candidates They lacked vision <laughs> You know everyone's just mad That he says what's on That's everyone's mind That's a throwback okay? oh, no. <laughs> Guys did you know That babies are born In the ninth month Of a pregnancy <laughs> It's gotta change It's gotta, gotta change stop. This has got to stop. I was born in the ninth month, and if I hadn't been, things would be a lot different. <laughs> I believe that all sharks should die. <laughs> <laughs> I am the last shark. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, boy. All right. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Here's a thought. Vincent D'Onofrio rating Donald Trump quotes as Wilson Fisk. <laughs> oh Fisk. my god. Please, somebody make that a video next time the next, ep the next season of Daredevil comes out. Can we crowdfund that somehow? Can like, we crowd? Can we get this on Kickstarter, guys? <laughs> <laughs> I'd, w I'd watch that YouTube video. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, I would actually pay uh, at least one dollar to see that. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was the name of that porn star that he had to pay off allegedly? Oh boy. Stormy, Stormy Daniels. Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, real quick, guys, I just came up with a really fun idea for a game for us to do here, which would be porn star or superhero. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do that uh, at all. <laughs> um. <laughs> because the answer would be harder than you think. Same with hey. the person playing. Uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> there's the door, Stormy. <laughs> Oh, wait, real quick. Can I comment for our YouTube audience? Hi, you can see us now. We have video on our videos. Imagine that. We're really sorry. Uh, you guys can see us, regrettably. Uh, it's a new thing we're doing. Hopefully you like it, although I don't know why you would. Because uh, uh, we're all handsome boys, and they just want to see us. Dislike, di dislike the video for Phil's hair. It's, yeah, I mean, it's pretty fucked right now. It's cool. <laughs> tell, tell Phil to run a fucking comb through his hair in the morning like a goddamn professional. No. I, uh, I got a haircut. And got my beard done for you guys. So hopefully you enjoy it. If you've never seen us before, this is us live in living color. You've seen the little nice uh, drawings that we have, but this is what we actually look like. Uh, if you're listening to this on, you know, a, po a podcast hosting platform, maybe jump over to YouTube to, you know, get a look at what we really uh, look like. And just to help you guys out, uh, I'm going to go through and we're going to tell everyone who we are. So I am Sean. I'm the host of the show. Uh, and I'm joined by Pete. Hi, I'm Pete. Kale. I'm Kale. I need a haircut. <laughs> Marco. Uh, I'm Marco. This is actually a mask. <laughs> what do you look like under the mask? I mean, that's the secret. And Phil. I'm Phil. Take me or leave me for how you will. My hair looks the way it does. I don't care. <laughs> All right. Trash now panda. I, I want to leave you. <laughs> <laughs> but it ain't because of your hair so uh you can find us all over the internet 
We are on iTunes, where we are a five-star rated podcast. Let's keep that tradition going, uh, unless you don't want to, uh, in which case, uh, that's fair. Um, We are on all other podcast hosting platforms, so check us out wherever it is that you prefer to listen to podcasts. And if Uh, we're not there, let us know. We'll get there. We're trying to get to Grindr as we speak. Oh, my God. (laughs) Grindr official sponsored podcast. No, I'm on (laughs) Grindr. I mean... (laughs) <laughs> all right <Just> no! <laughs> we're actually on all social media platforms we are at the comics pals wherever you choose to purchase your social media uh you can write to us at the comics pals gmail.com and you can write in with your random question of the week a buy or sell uh your thoughts on anything we talk about on this or any other episode of the comics pals and we'll read your messages on the air if they're uh interesting uh, and then, of course, last but certainly not least, we are on YouTube, where you can become a pal by hitting that sweet subscribe button. Uh, you can leave us a like and a comment and share the video with your friends to bring them on board as well, because uh, these things matter to us. Um, let's try to get let's try to get to and through 100 subscribers. Help us out. Hit that subscribe button. Yeah, like if you're an audio listener and you just listen to us on podcast services, take take please take five minutes, jump over there, use your Gmail account, and just hit the subscribe button. It's like a huge help to us. So that's right. Do us that favor, please. So uh, let's let's get jump started here with some reader mail. We've got quite a bit today to read off. All righty. So uh, our first bit of reader mail uh, comes from James McMahon, who's a regular listener of the show. He uh, wrote in last week as well. Um, so he wrote in about uh, some of the conversation we had on episode 64, which was our one about uh, Bendis coming on to Action Comics number 1000 and uh, the Stan Lee allegations. So James writes in and says, The comment Sean made about, the, about being pigeonholed as, as a writer because of your culture, background, race, gender, love it. I seriously hit me because of how right you are. As a writer, I sometimes worry about the idea of representing well-main characters or important who are of a different race or culture or even, of course, who are just women, you know, because I hadn't experienced the marginalization or injustice they go through. I think you are right, though. As a writer, a good character is based partially on experience, but also on research and learning how that is. And if a director can write all sorts of stories, you as a writer should have those opportunities. If a white male comic writer creates a female hero or Hispanic hero, that is great if they do well and write, write it correctly and respectfully. So the same should go for a black comic writer if that person wanted to write about a hero or story featuring another culture, race, background, whatever. Do the research. Try not to suck at writing. Put your heart into it. All I ask. Long sorry. Comment. Long comment. Sorry. Great point. Thank you, James, for writing in and uh, for your very astute comment. Um, I think that, you know, we, we talked about it already last week, but uh, I just think more opportunities for people that are, you know, minorities to have the opportunity to write for things that don't immediately reflect them uh, would be great for everybody. Because at the end of the day, if we want more voices, different kinds of voices on these books, that doesn't just mean that black people write black characters. It means that they get to write every kind of character. And uh, that's that's actual progress. Um, bringing on ta Coates to write Black Panther is great, but let's see him on Captain America. That's mm-hmm. that's you know that's what I'm looking for, uh, but thanks again for writing. It. Yeah, thanks a lot, James. We love hearing from you. Uh, so we got a, we got another comment on the, uh, the and both of these are from YouTube. Sorry. Uh, so we got another comment on that video from uh, YouTube user Ice Highwind who writes in and says, "New rule: If you're over ninety, you can't be a predator." Hot. So day. I'm pretty sure you missed the point of that conversation we had. What a gro What a gross fucking comment. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I guess the person, you know, feels like we didn't do enough to condemn Stan's behavior. And to that, I say, uh, I respectfully disagree. Uh, I was very clear on the fact that if those allegations are true, uh, obviously that's horrible. And I'm, I'm not in support of those things on any level. And I also don't, I don't have, I'm not, I don't think that they couldn't be true. I think they could be true. You can make an allegation about anything anybody that could be true sure it could be true uh is it true that's another matter um and uh i mean it was it was a very uncomfortable situation for sure and i don't think any one of us was even implying 
that he could not be a predator. He absolutely could be. Uh, yeah, I, not at all. I, I interpreted him as saying that, uh, like, literally, like, he was defending Stanley. That was my yeah. interpretation. Because, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. because, yeah. because he's because 90. He's old. Yeah. Right. That was my understanding as well. Okay. No. Yeah, I, I, I took it the same way that Sean did, that he was, cri- uh, he or she, I guess, was criticizing us for not throwing Stan under the bus more. Yeah, that was a very snarky, sassy comment. That's how I took it. That, well, that's yeah. silly because we were all very critical, especially Kale. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, no, I think. I think this was a, a comment specifically for uh, I don't know pro harassment crowd. Stan stands. I fucking hate Stan that term stands. so much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, carry on. Um. So thanks for writing in, Ice High Wind. <laughs> yeah, sure. But don't. Oh, try again. <laughs> uh, so then we got a Facebook message from one uh, Brian Allen who wrote in and said, Hey, pals, I'm new to comics and I've been getting my education on them from you guys. Well, that's great. Thanks for thanks for Yay. Yay. That's unfortunate. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he says, I'm also trying to get interested in, but is still wholesome and preferably prominently female. Uh, she is eight years old. What would you guys recommend? So Sean already replied to this one uh, in the message. So why don't you just repeat your answers for the listeners at home? And then I, I think we have some other ones to weigh in as well. Yeah. So I recommended to him uh, Miss Marvel uh, starring Kamala Khan. I second that one for sure. Yeah. The DC Girls line of comics. I think those are definitely really good for uh, young girls. And then uh, Spider-Man Loves Mary Jane. I've personally not read that, but everything that I've heard is that it's definitely for younger people um, and largely is from Mary Jane's perspective on their high school experience. I think Matt Murphy from The Long Box is a fan of that book, unsurprisingly. <laughs> uh, and uh, he seemed pleased with those, but I figured that that all of us would have uh, additional recommendations. So the question is, what books would you guys recommend for a young kid? So I have a an eight year old sister, um, and I I like to get her um, Tiny Titans. If you're into uh, superheroes, it's just a you know a fun little. Um, it's sort of like Teen Titans Go in that it's you know silly and and like cartoony, yeah, whimsical, yeah. Uh, but not quite as um, um, epileptic and SpongeBobby, which is which isn't to say anything about Teen Titans Go. I love Teen Titans Go. I think it's hilarious. And then also there's a, a comic called Princeless, which is uh, sort of, it sort of subverts the the you know the princess getting rescued trope and um, is all about a uh, a young princess going out to fight her own battles and 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 be her own savior um there's a a particular um moment where she goes out to try and find her own armor but all of the armor that is made for women is all stereotypical comic book and video game women I like armor. That. that's a, that's cute so like you get so you get like you get like the bikini or uh you know the uh, the wonder woman girdle or you know stuff like that girdle um it, yeah really yeah girdle <laughs> uh other than that i uh I, w- I would recommend pretty much anything from boombox i think it's yep. a great um a, gr- a great line for for kids mm-hmm. well as, especially i think at her age there's like a decent chance that she's invested in one of the ip that they yeah. do books about like they have That's an adventure right. time comic there's a steven universe comic um and by all accounts they're good yeah so um and also i uh, i actually responded to uh there was a a similar comment on twitter um brian wecht from uh what the game grumps he actually he has a, a young daughter and he had asked this question i think like a day or two ago too so i, I had responded with um calvin and Hobbes. um nice nice oh um, hell yeah that's very formative reading for me as a kid for yeah sure. similarly like you know that, that that was a great strip for me too um and, and i mean don't shy away from comic strips either like those are really cool like a cool entrance into into comics as well um like new like like newspaper comics yeah like newspaper comics yeah um right right. yeah like calvin and Hobbes was such a good uh point of entry for me for for comics like as a kid because like you could get those really great big anthologies for like 20 bucks and it's like for a little kid that's a lot of reading you know and and it's easy to like get through a one story strip or some of the more long form stuff that watterson did um, and that was like the first like comic I'd ever read that like 
dealt with themes that were like bigger and broader mm-hmm. and more existential, but still done in a way that I think is approachable for children. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then I also had uh, written My Little Pony. Um, there are like it is a very huge series, um, and I know I know there's a, like a lot of fans around it. It's a very I know it's supposed to be a very like uh, supportive group as well. So I mean, even getting into like the dialogue there, uh, she is eight, so it's a little young, but. Um, the the comic itself is supposed to be very very well done um and scooby doo but like the the dc stuff some of the the looney tunes stuff that dc publishes that's mm. outside of the hanna barbera oh, yeah, yeah. like that stuff uh is is really good too scooby doo and like looney tunes cool uh peter phil oh and idw's got a ducktales comic as well right now that's supposed to be very good that's another thing that would probably be very child friendly does doesn't uh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have a like a younger yeah they have like an all ages one that's based on the Nickelodeon cartoon yeah. uh, we're, we're veering a little bit outside of his request yeah, for stuff yeah. that's female centric but I mean if she's into any of these cartoons those are easy points of entry right so um, and certainly nothing wrong with a young girl reading Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics that's that's awesome no no not at all of course not um, so yeah I mean I think that's a lot right I, I feel like any of those are, are great recommendations yeah so uh, thanks a lot for writing in. I was very, very happy to see that message. And uh, I encourage you to definitely continue your journey uh, in the comic space. And uh, I hope that introducing your daughter to comics goes well. And keep us uh, up to date on the progress for both of you guys. And we'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Yeah, let us let us know what book she likes. And again, if you want to write into us, there are many ways you can do so. Obviously, all of these people chose... Uh, different paths, YouTube, Facebook message. Those are great. You can also do so by writing into the show at thecomicspals at gmail.com. Uh, so now let's jump into our question for the week. Oh, does that mean it's time for the random question of the week? Yes. Oh, okay. yes, it does. We're going to have to figure out a, a, a bumper or a stinger for that because it really takes the magic out of it seeing Pete when you do see that. Me do it. <laughs> it's so humanizing. <laughs> so one of my favorite comics last year, uh surprisingly, was the Batman and Ninja Turtles crossover. I had a lot of fun with it. It wasn't, you know, the deepest book, but I you know, a short a short mini series. Um Combining two of my loves for my entire life, you know, what, where can you go wrong? So I thought, what would be a cool uh, clash of characters um, that don't typically, that can't interact on, under other circumstances? So what what your, your two characters or groups or whatever that you would like to see have a short miniseries uh, together, like a, like a five issue run or something like that, four or five issues. Can can I bring up a book that I've read that was like a, a weird one like that, like a mashup like that? You could bring it up, but that can't be your answer. All right, it well, um, there there was a really cool one with Predator and Archie crossover. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> it was super good. It was super good. Really, really cool. No, it wasn't. I read that. Yeah, no, no. You are you serious? It was really good, dude. No, it Did wasn't. Did you not enjoy it? It was, it was fine right. for what it was, but it was good. I thought it was good. <laughs> Phil doesn't like fun. Well, what's your answer? Uh, my answer is um, Saga and Star Wars. All right. I don't know. It's just, I just thought it'd be cool. Like them somehow being in, in that kind of a universe uh, and lightsabers in the force. I don't know. Something I was I, I, I was digging. I was like, oh, that's a cool idea. I would hate that so much. All right. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is where just everyone shits on Marco. Can my answer be based off a mild crossover that happened that never got a series? No. Damn it. All right, well, then my honorable <laughs> mention is there's one issue of Invincible back when Robert Kirkman was still working at Marvel where um, for Marvel team up number 15, Invincible like crossed over into the Marvel universe and it was like part of an Invincible storyline. And um, I always wish that they had gotten like a little bit more than just the one issue meet between Peter and Mark. Uh, I would have liked to see those two characters get the chance to bounce off each other a little bit more. I'm not like I'm not super into crossovers like that. Like normally, I I would rather things just kind of stay like separate. I want to see Invincible and Superman meet. That would be fun. Surface they have like similar powers, yeah. and I feel like 
it would be cool to see them kind of like duke it out and then like have the classic superhero thing of just like, but wait, we're both on the right side of history, so let's just be friends instead. I can see there being a really good conversation there. Superman beats up his dad. Oh shit, yeah, you can beat up Omni Man and then Invincible goes to fight him and they fucking. Yeah, no, all right. Yo, this is good. This is good. Uh, Sean, can I change my answer? No. No, get what? out of here. I have a better one. I have a better one. <laughs> The spirit and alien. What? These are so weird. That's, no, that's not better at all. What? <laughs> all right. I'm done, listeners. So are we, Marco. <laughs> Is that a promise? Yeah. Phil, you got one? All right. So I want to see the Ninja Turtles with uh, <laughs> their side characters, um, the hockey man and the reporter. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Take on the Monstars from Space Jam. Oh, my God. <laughs> in a game of basketball or in a fight? In a game of basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and then a fight. <laughs> well, that's only if the Ninja Turtles lose. Yeah, I'd watch that. I Yeah, I'd, I would. I'd give that book a, sh- I'd I'd give that book a chance. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See? You guys dismissed it at first and you thought about it and like... No, I dismissed you. <laughs> Oh, that's that's fair. <laughs> Kale? Uh, so my original one does actually exist. I Googled it. Um, it's uh, My original one was uh, the Ninja Turtles and uh, the Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. That was a cause. <laughs> that makes yeah. sense. I believe that happened. Yeah. Uh, like, there's no, no way you could convince me that they don't live in the same world. I think it's a really solid crossover. Um, Do they have to fight ghost ninjas? <laughs> they'd be yes. cool. They'd be cool. Uh, so my real one, I guess, would be Spirit and Dick Tracy. Oh, that would be fun. Wait, it wouldn't be Spirit and Alien? Boo. N- no, because I have taste. Oh, my okay. God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Savage. Uh, for me, I, I mean, it's going to be very generic, right? Like, I, I really want to see Batman and Captain America together. That's happened before. Has it? Yeah, a bunch of times. Yeah, two times, dude. Yeah, dude, the amalgam stuff. Uh-huh. Right, right. I wrote an article about it at CBR. Da, 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 go check Back it out. Back when Marvel and DC had a healthy working relationship. I f- yeah, I forgot I forgot about that one. If by healthy working relationship you mean the ship was on, or both their ships were on fire, so they decided to throw a bucket of water on each other. Hey, man. I, I dig it. <laughs> um, well, I was just thinking it'd be, it'd be cool to see Captain America, like, witness the Joker firsthand and kind of call into question kind of... Like, that, that, that there's a person like that that exists. What does that mean for society? Yeah. That he's a regular guy, not a Nazi, you know? Dude, the, there's a great panel in that the, the book where Red Skull... Yeah, you get it, yeah. Kale. Uh, Red Skull and Joker have met before. They meet, and they're, like, it's working so together. <laughs> and then Joker's like, wait, you're a real Nazi? I thought that was just a get-up. And he fucking, like, punches Red Skull, and he's like, I might be a psychopath, but I'm an American. It's <laughs> so dumb. It's the fucking... It's the funniest fucking panel. It's so goddamn 90s. I love it. Wow. I got to pick that up. I I had it a long, long, long time ago, and I gave it away to a friend. And, uh, well, I I let him borrow it. And And he never gave it back. I, I, like, I had to, I, like, bought a bunch of digital copies of all that crap, so. (laughs) Uh, so, okay, well, then, my real answer is going to be as generic. Um, (laughs) and before you guys react, let me explain the idea. Uh, okay. Batman and Punisher. And That's happened who, too. When did that? When did that happen? <laughs> In the Amalgam series, <laughs> there was a uh, there. Yeah, there's another series where it was a Batman Punisher crossover, <laughs> and it's like the first one is with Azrael when he was Batman. Uh, okay. And and then real Batman comes back, and like they like actually have a continuity as well. Huh. Uh, yeah, because Frank goes back to Gotham and like meets Bruce and like expects him to act like Azrael. All right. <laughs> What, what else you got for me? <laughs> hey, just before you say this one, Superman and Spider Man have met too. So yep. I wasn't going there. I, was, I wasn't. <laughs> going, even I even met there. Archie in the gang. Really? Sure has. Did he murder them? You have to read and find out. A thirty-year-old issue. No, that's that's how that's how Archie learned how to fucking get cut in Riverdale. <laughs> how to get cut? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, shoot, guys. You have no more crossovers. Come on, Sean. One more. One more. <laughs> Let's see if you can pick another amalgam crossover. I'd by love accident. to see a video game where <laughs> the Mortal Kombat characters fight the DC Comics characters. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. That game was broken, and I loved it. So, in that case, my answer is the characters from Black Science meet the Fantastic hmm. Four. So, 
what what kale what now <laughs> no I'm, I'm i'm disappointed because it it doesn't exist <laughs> oh. not because i want it to but because i thought you would say one that exists <laughs> <laughs> i don't even want to do this anymore whatever that's my answer no explain it uh so they're kind of similar in the sense that the the characters in black science are well, the main character is sort of like a, a Reed Richards esque uh, individual, um, but he's imperfect. Whereas Reed Richards is kind of like you know this great father and this great traveler. The character from Kale, can you with the faces, with the faces, please, hey, bro? We're on YouTube now. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, 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 let's let's move on. <laughs> Nope, Sean's done, everyone. I thought that was a good idea. I liked it. All right. Thank you. I thought it was fine. I could take or leave it. <laughs> Vote for your favorite. So anyway, uh, let's jump into our pals polls for the week. So Marco chose Monstrous number 13. Um, so Monstrous went on hiatus for a while. It's It's been, uh, um, I think, gone for almost like three, four months. Um, so I'm really excited for it to just be coming back. The arc that just passed was really cool. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the book. Uh, Santa Takeda's art is off the walls. It's it's amazing. Um, and Marjorie Liu's writing um, has as strong as ever. I am hooked every time I read the, the, an issue of it. So I'm really excited for this to come back and see where this next arc sort of takes us. Awesome. Yeah, uh, that's a book that I kind of lapsed with, but I've bought every, I've I've got every issue, so I'm gonna jump back into it once, yeah. uh, once this one comes up. Uh, so from Kale, we've got Green Arrow, The Archer's Quest, trade. So this is a new edition of the uh, Brad Meltzer, Phil Hester uh, trade from I don't know the early two thousands, back when Green Arrow uh, came back to life because of comic book nonsense. Uh, <laughs> It's basically about him sort of putting his life back together and, and going through all of his history um, and finding important things from his past that sort of interact with what he, he wants his future to be. Um, it's, a, it's written by uh, Brad Meltzer, like I said, and if you, if you know his writing from stuff like Identity Crisis or uh, his, uh, JLA, yeah, his JLA run or any of his books... Um, he does a an amazing job of creating uh this sentimentality uh within the the story i had it on my pals poll list as well and uh i really really liked that early 2000s green arrow stuff before judd winnick came in yeah yeah and this is the only title i really like uh phil hester on i'm not i'm not a huge fan of phil hester but uh green arrow really works for him yes sir he's very blocky yeah you also chose Mortal Iron Fists trade. So this is a Comixology uh, exclusive. It's a, a story about Danny Rand uh, training up the new Iron Fist, uh, which, you know, as I'm sure all of you uh, know, the Iron Fist is a title that is passed down to one person who goes and, and hugs a dragon and gets a cool tattoo and... Um, basically uh so he's training the new one and the new one is a little girl and that's just it's just such an odd pairing and combination that i'm super interested in it so i'm I'm really excited this is out and i can go pick it up and is, isn't it like he's like adopting her or something like it's like a batman robin like young ward kind of situation or am i misremembering that i i'm not a hundred percent sure on I, that. I feel like i remember that being in the press release when we talked about this like as a news story but I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, listeners. And then <clears throat> you also chose Sex Criminals 21. Uh, so specifically, I chose the Chris Anka cover because uh, that's going to be sexy. Sex Criminals has really good alternative covers. Like, I've kind of fallen out of that book since the second arc, I guess. But um, I'd like to get back to it. But yeah, they, they always do really fun covers. Like when they do the NSFW ones, they get like yeah, really funny. awesome artists to uh, to do them. Yeah. I have one from um, from uh, Brian Leo Matt that like is just awesome it's disgusting cool. <laughs> yeah i have uh, i have kate Letts. oh yeah oh, that nice. one was gross too <laughs> yeah phil you did you have any doomsday clock baby yep you and i both on doomsday that's out clock. this week why don't you talk about it yeah it's out next week i mean what, what, what yeah what is there to say this is the event of the year ladies and gentlemen Do, are you interested in reading the most captivating and alluring title out of dc comics featuring two of the greatest writer artists 
tandem in the industry, Jeff Johns and um uh my boy, what's Ga- his name? Gary Frank. Gary Frank. That's bad that I forgot it for a second. <laughs> yeah, you look like a chump right now. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> That's okay, Phil. I can't wait for Matt Murphy to say you don't read comics? You didn't know that Batman and Captain America had already interacted? <laughs> well, scrub. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. Who cares about Matt Murphy? That's right. What I do care about, ladies and gentlemen, is Doomsday Clock number three, because I think the first two issues were really good. I know Pete was especially high in that second issue. I love um, it. Tune in next week to find out our reaction, because we're going to be following this book all year long. It's a shame. That I won't be on that. Uh, I won't be on the next episode because I won't get to talk. Oh yeah, neither of you guys will be here. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> All right. So that covers the pals polls. Uh, if you guys want to share the books that you're going to be reading this upcoming week with us, you can do so in all the aforementioned ways. So let's jump into the news and uh, start with something really, really interesting. Uh, Tom King, the resident favorite writer of the comics pals has announced a new not a book necessarily but a new idea called sanctuary there was a a panel at an event that dc held in dc um where tom king talked about an idea for something that's called sanctuary and i'll read tom king's words because he'll explain it better than i will every dc comic is full of violence It's fun and exciting, and I love reading about that, but do we talk about the consequences of that, both on the characters and the readers, and they asked me to think about that and do something with it, and we are. We've created something, it's called Sanctuary. We're creating something where it's sort of like a crisis center for superheroes, and it's going to be DC-wide, and all the heroes... All, all the superheroes, and it's going to be a place where these superheroes who are living violent lives every single day, Batman gets in a fight every single night, five times a night. And so we're creating a space where superheroes can go that sort of mimics the good work people are doing for veterans around the world, where they can have a space where they can actually admit that this violence has consequences for them. And has affected them mentally so that your greatest heroes who are inspiring our children can proudly say, yes, I've had some mental difficulties. And yes, working with people has helped me through them. And we don't hide behind that. That's that's a very interesting concept. And there's a lot of meat there, but we don't necessarily know what it's going to look like. It sounds like this is just going to be uh, kind of like how Night Nurse was a character who brought in superheroes to patch them up. It sounds like this will exist as, as something similar to that, and there will be a line-wide usage of this sanctuary place. Um, the one thing that stuck out to me that I wonder if this is you know relevant is that he calls it a crisis center. That could just be language that he's using, but crisis obviously is a loaded word when you're talking about DC. So is this maybe a reaction to a crisis that occurs, or... This, is this like the lead into something maybe? Uh, I obviously could be looking too deeply into his verbiage, but I'm just throwing that out there. What do you guys think about this? I think this is a really great idea. <clears throat> I think this is like um, just the way he's talking about it. I think uh, I, I don't think anybody on this panel would disagree that we have a problem with how we deal with mental health, um, not just in this country, but around the world. And I think um, humanizing superheroes is something I'm always for. So as a reader, I'm interested in this idea because I am interested to to think about what what does it look like for Batman to to have like, you know, or not to have PTSD, but to actually acknowledge that he has it. Right. And like, what could that mean for some young reader who's dealing with their own mental illness to think like, you know what, like Superman has these problems, too. You know, like I think that that could be a really powerful thing. And I think Tom King is absolutely the, the correct writer to do it, because as we've said time and time again, I think he's probably the best writer in the industry, um, even if not my favorite. But uh, I also think he has a personal experience with this. He went to war. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's he's a veteran, you know, so I'm sure he deals with some level of, of PTSD. And uh, he he said this week that the best thing he ever did and the best advice he ever got was to get a dog specifically for it. Right. So yeah. there you go. 
Um, so I think he is uniquely equipped to tell this story, and I I really think this could, uh, I mean, be interesting from a storytelling perspective, but also really do some good for uh, some of the readers out there. And that's I mean, that's the goal, right? Good art that's impactful. Sounds great. Yeah, I think I, I echo everything Pete said. Uh, the interesting catch here would be like you know how do you get someone like how do you get batman into a place like this Mm -hmm. uh he's been pretty consistently the type of character who both feels that he's too strong uh to fall to that uh sort of uh, not manipulation but um you know mental issue just like let somebody in in that level that like to analyze you and uh but also he's also i i feel like part of his training would sort of lend him to be able to block that stuff out so i think i think there is a a really interesting batman story to tell there and i think i really think more so than anyone else tom king is is probably better equipped to to tell it Especially when you think about how he's been treating Batman as a writer, that, like, he does seem yeah. to, like, be interested in exploring the more human side of Batman, like, that he is, mm-hmm. you know, the whole arc of him wanting to get married and, like, have a life outside of crime fighting is, like, this also seems like an appropriate time for him to maybe get his mental health in order, right? So that he can be a better yeah. husband, father, superhero. Like, I think there's a really good story there. I'm not as uh, sold on this. I-, I think the premise is fine and could be phenomenal but it's always in the execution this is not something that only tom king is going to handle because this isn't a book so this could be great in the batman issues that you know talk about this um but it could suck in others so because of that i'm not immediately high on the concept uh it's really going to depend on how it rolls out and i'm generally weary of any sort of uh mandate you know, they asked him to think about it, and this is what he came up with, and that's great. But this is just the one writer as opposed to, you know, the however many writers DC actually has. This isn't even a one-size-fits-all concept necessarily because it works. Like, there's there are some characters that it's very logical for, and I could see an argument for, like, why Flash would be great for this. I could definitely see Flash embracing something like this. But is Wonder Woman as interested, you know? Um does she have the same perspective on violence that other heroes do? It could be interesting to explore that, but without um, without the sort of, you know, not every writer is going to treat it the same way. And so that means that there's room for it to fail. And I would... Yeah, and like not every writer has the firsthand experience that someone like Tom King has maybe, you know? Right. So do they treat it with the kind of respect that it needs? And also, are they allowed to do things like I'm not saying that this is the right or wrong choice, but maybe Batman would reject this, you know? And is that okay? Is that something that could happen? Could that could that be interesting story-wise? Um, I don't want them to just say, okay, blanketly, every character has to do this. Yeah. Every character has to embrace this. I want to see a story, you know? So I'm not I'm not super sold until we see what happens. Sure. I think I think the example you gave of Wonder Woman would actually be interesting too, though. If there are some heroes who are just like, "Hey, like you know, not everybody has the same reaction to it because maybe they don't have the same viewpoint of it, right?" And like that could be cool too, you know. Like I think I think you're right though. We have to see how it ends up being used for sure. Um, I am really excited to see what Tom does with it though. Given it's his idea, it'll be you know. For sure. It'll be interesting. I'm sure he's got a story to tell yeah. there. Phil, what are, you, what are your thoughts? I think there's a lot of... I, th- I think there's something... I think there's meat to it. I, I Obviously, this is something that Tom King is really passionate about. Like, having read everything he's written... I'm behind on Batman, but I mean, I've read everything this guy's written. And, like, his two major themes and everything is, like, PTSD and I love my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really. I, I mean, I, there's not too much to say yet. It, it's, it's. I think it's heavy in the speculation phase, and I think what you said, Sean, is super salient. Um, I'm curious to see how it develops, but uh, obviously, yeah. I mean, what everything Pete said is accurate too. Like mental health is a huge issue. PTSD is a massive problem at at the very least in the United States. So, um, yeah, let's see how they h- handle it. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm with you, Sean, that, like, 
the concept uh is definitely really cool the the idea is coming from a good uh, a good place and I, i'm more interested to see how it's going to be executed like i know it is coming from a personal place for tom king so i know that that's gonna i have i have tr- i trust that that'll be uh like a really well informed and really uh well executed uh perspective but i i'm i'm interested to see how it'll happen across the board um right. So for that, I'm 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 cautiously optimistic, and it, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see it. Sure, I I think this would work really well in Marvel. I think it it, it apply it would apply great to Marvel's heroes almost more than DC, just because I could see a lot of Marvel characters needing this. So many of yeah. them are street level and dealing with, you know, th- like it's one thing to fight Dark Side, you know, but it's another to have to deal with like regular humans who are just, you know, like going through real problems that cause them to be violent and then Spider-Man has to come and deal with them. That's got to be, you know, a weight on their shoulders. For sure. For sure. And yeah, right. Like it's, it's one thing when you're like, Hey, we're the Avengers taking on this world ending evil. It's another thing when you're, you know, daredevil and you are busting up like, you know, like sex trafficking rings or something like that. Right. Like that's the kind of stuff that I feel like, you know, it, it's not it, obviously it's clean cut that you're doing good there, but that's the kind of shit that like, yeah, I saved this person. But how many more of these are around that I'm not getting to? And, you know, I, I think there is a lot there you can do with street level superheroes because they deal with more human problems like cops. Like, the yeah, way right. Cops, exactly. You know, that's why I thought of Flash, because Flash is like, you know, closer to the street than, you know, a lot of the other characters. But uh, uh, so we talked about D.C., and Action Comics 1000 last week, obviously, we talked about Brian Michael Bendis and the announcement that his first DC work would appear in this issue. Um, but we've learned a little more about the book, including the fact that the Red Trunks will be making their grand return in, in Action Comics 1000. Superman will once again uh, put his, wear his underwear on the outside of his clothes. Where it belongs. Yeah, That's right. I'm happy about this. And have you guys ever done that, like as a goof? Yeah. When I was oh, a kid, yeah. I used to do it, yeah. Oh, as a kid? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it used to be uh, the design for Batman and Superman to wear their underwear on the outside of their pants comes from uh, circus strongman tradition where people in the, in the turn of the century would wear their underwear on the outside as like a colorful getup because it's a circus. And in that tradition, um, well, it was also because sometimes when they would lift, they would rip, and their fucking, you know, privates would fall right. out, and <laughs> nobody wants to see an eye full of strongman balls. <laughs> oh, well, people might. So, so um, with regard to Superman's red trunks returning, I don't think it matters that much. Uh, I love Superman. Obviously, he's my favorite comic book character. Um, I think the only significant thing about the red trunks is that it's a good palette breaker. Um, with, without yeah, yeah. it, aesthetically, yeah. it looks. Without better. It, 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 Superman looks just uh, a little strange. Though I think they've gotten better at that design wise the last couple of years, as opposed to Jim Lee's armored Superman from the New Fifty Two. They've made the belt bigger, or they'll add more color around there, like yellow and red and stuff. But I mean, yeah, just I, I think I, I think Superman's the most nostalgic centered character like he, his design is like the most uh unflexible for most people i think like batman you can mix up a little bit you can make him all bl- like his costume all black you can make it gray you can make it bl- the cow blue you can add yellow to the insignia superman people have this vision where <laughs> um that was not a callback um <laughs> where his costume is blue he's got red underwear yellow belt, red cape, and, like, maybe the only thing that's different is he has a yellow insignia on the cape. Also red boots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, I know most people are going to be happy about this. I, I mean, to me, it's kind of a goof, to be honest. Like, it's, it's like, whatever. Uh, it's funny that they ever took them away. Um, that's This is the problem with, with Superman. <laughs> yeah, it, you're right. It's, it's a perfect... I mean, they kind of struck gold the first time, and there's not really, in my mind, a, a reason to iterate much. But hey, uh, Jim Lee apparently thought that they were stupid and decided to take them away in 2011. Um, the real story here, to me, is that uh, we now know what the full roster of talent 
um, or nearly the full roster of talent will be on Action Comics 1000. So um, we're talking about creative teams that include uh, Richard Donner, who's going to work with uh, Jeff Johns, and the art's going to be by uh, Olivier Coipel. Fantastic. Um, Dang. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, Paul Dini with Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Fantastic. Uh, Tom nice. King and Clay Mann with Jordi Belair. Um, this is the one I'm really excited about. Uh, Brad Meltzer with John Cassidy and Laura Martin. <laughs> I think that's that's incredible. Uh, you lost um, me at John Cassidy. I'm not I'm not crazy about his art. No, I, You're not a fan. Not, not really. No. Well, it's like oh, man. It, he's got that. He's got that. It's like almost photo photorealism, but then not quite. I'm just yeah. I'm just not not there for him. All right, fair enough. Uh, but yeah, Brad Meltzer. I. Uh, they they they'd have made a huge mistake not including Brad Meltzer in on this, and I'm I'm really I, glad they yeah. did. I agree with that. Um, and Laura Martin, obviously, just a yeah a phenomenal. Um, Louise Simonson with Jerry Ordway, uh, Scott Snyder with Tim Sale. Damn, ooh, yeah. some really yeah, really good talent. Yeah, and there's more to come. So, be, uh, Bendis is doing his with Ivan Reese, right? Yeah, Jim. Oh, Jim, Jim Lee. Lee. Oh, this yeah. one is Jim, Jim Lee. Right. Oh, yeah. Brad. Yeah. Yeah, remember we said with the let him down from his ivory tower to draw a book. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> he probably started two years ago because of how long it takes for him to meet a deadline. Oh man. <laughs> Bendis just gets like twenty. He's like, here, here's the pages. Write a story around it. <laughs> the big name missing on that list is uh is Grant. That's a good point. Well maybe he said there's more I know, to come, I know. so I'm not saying I'm just saying so far that's the big name missing. I think, no, I think you're Let's right. Let's do it. Grant oh, and Yannick. Man, be yeah. sick. I would yeah. be fucking so here for that. Grant and uh, Frank Quitely would be apropos. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask you guys a question. Uh, so let's do let's do like some quick fantasy casting, right? If you could have anyone play Batgirl, number one actress that comes to mind. Who who, who do you think of Batgirl? Saoirse Ronan. I don't know who that is. Saoirse Ronan is in Lady Bird, the like most critically acclaimed film of the year. She was in Brooklyn. Uh, well, some of us don't have the money to go out and watch critically acclaimed movies. What a snob! It's Carry hard. It's hard to get out and watch a good every movie. <laughs> no, we're not. We asked yes. you a question and you got snarky. Like she was in Lady Bird. Oh, it's like your fucking monocle popped off your face. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's just in a, she's in, she's been a lot of like she was in the Grand Budapest Hotel. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah, see, these would have been helpful things. Like, uh, I just assumed everyone oh, knew who was she, she was. Girl? Was she the girl no, from... Yes. Uh, oh, oh, okay. I was actually oh, yeah, thinking she's of her. Good. Yeah, I want her. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Okay, cool. Kale? You know, uh, a young, a younger Kristen Bell would be really good in her Veronica Mars days. Yeah. Uh, she'd be a good oracle, though. Oh, yeah. Um... Kill, you're going to have to help me up out on her name, but I actually would really like it to be the actress who you wanted to play Squirrel Girl, the one from um, Stranger Things who played uh, Barb, and she was on uh, Riverdale. Oh. Uh, as, uh, uh, Shannon, Shannon wait, Purser. Yes. You were asking Kale to pronounce a name for you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> wait, what's it? Shannon what? Purser. Purser. Yeah, I think she'd be good. I, I like her. She's a young talent. Um, she's a good actress. She's a redhead. Uh what, what more do we need, right? I don't think she is. Well, she's played two redheads on TV, and I believed it. So, Has she? Yeah, wasn't isn't both Barb and the girl she plays on Riverdale redheads? I thought I thought they no, were both it's not the same sort character. of brown. Really? Am I thinking of two different hair. actresses? Yeah, that's, those are two different actresses. Really? Maybe Pete wants yeah. two different women to play uh, Barbara Gordon. Bar- I mean, Barb and Ethel? No. Yeah, that's, no, that's they're, the, same, they're the same person, but... So, yeah, okay. The, wh- whatever. That's I don't think they have red hair. So, maybe they just have, like, strawberry brown hair or whatever. Uh, okay, yeah, and maybe. Either yeah. way, that's my pick. Yeah, I, I think she'd be good, and I, I feel like... You know, again, she's a young talent, and, like, that's who I want. Is I, I, I don't want someone who I'm like, I have all this familiarity with from this and that and this and that. You know, I, it would be cool to have somebody who's, like, fresh blood, but who's a proven talent, you know? So... Good pick, I think. My pick is Sophie Turner. Uh, mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Totally. Nah, she she blew her chance with uh, Jean Grey. <laughs> right. um, hey, Ryan Reynolds I, I got a second chance her. with Deadpool. You never know. I, that, yeah, that's true, too. 
No, I said she can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see Sophie Turner play uh, any character. Um, but there is one actress who is very much campaigning for the role of Batgirl. And that is someone that none of us said. Probably someone that none of us even thought of. And that's Lindsay Lohan. Ha! I Listen, 10 years ago... 15 years ago that might have worked <laughs> when she was 15 <laughs> sure yeah I mean yeah back like, young or at times after Mean Girls before her be fully loaded that's where Lindsay Lohan had a chance I, w- I, w- I, w- I would even I would even argue just after her be fully loaded okay yeah but no, yeah, like this this was such a like ridiculous there's more context you probably want to get through right Sean Absolutely. Go ahead, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> she's been campaigning for the role of uh, of Batgirl, and she started a a, a Twitter campaign uh, to get her fans to, you know, let Joss Whedon know that she wants to play Batgirl really, really badly. Uh, and so she posted an image of herself uh, alongside an image of Batgirl, kind of taking her mask off. I believe it was a cover from Gail Simone's run. And I mean, the there are there is definitely a uh, similarity in their look, um, but Lindsay Lohan believes that the reason why no one has approached her about the role is because people won't stop talking about Lindsay's past. And so she went on Wendy Williams and uh, had the following to say: "I don't like when people always bring up and rehash the past. This is actually quite a long time ago if you think about it now, and I'd rather just stay focused on what I want to do next." Whenever people bring up the past things I've experienced and gone through, like jail, working at the morgue, which is actually traumatizing (laughs) stuff, I've learned my lessons. It distracts from actually maybe meeting with people to do Batgirl, maybe doing a Mean Girls 2. It really distracts people, and they only think about the negative, and I don't think that's a way to move forward in life. So, I I thought this was just so silly. Because it's like, of course you feel that way, Lindsay Lohan. Your career has become a train wreck because you were famously uh, a drug addict for a while. You haven't made a movie that's grossed over $10 million in, like, a decade. It's like, you don't have a career for a reason, you know? Like, and it's... it's (laughs) She hasn't made a movie that's grossed more than $35 million since, uh, yeah, since the day of blockbuster videos. Jeez. Yeah. Go ahead, Kale. Uh, I was say it's it's a real shame. Like I think I think she would be a really good Batgirl, and I think she would would have been a really good Batgirl. You know, back in the day of blockbuster videos. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but like it, it's that thing where like with her her Mean Girl compatriots, like a lot of them focused on acting, and you know, uh, went on to do. Re- Amanda Seyfried, Rachel McAdams, um, even even the um, uh, the other one who's always trying to make Fetch happen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she she voices Zatanna on Young Justice. Like, you know, you you kind of blew up. And sorry, I'm not saying your time in the limelight's done, but you're probably not gonna play a superhero. <laughs> Especially in, like, not to be, like, ageist or whatever, but, like, you're 31 and you want to play, like, a teenage character. It's, like, she not that long ago was saying, oh, I would be perfect to play Ariel in a live-action Little Mermaid. And it's, like, no, you wouldn't. Little Mermaid is supposed to be a teenage girl. You're 31, Lindsay Lohan. Well, I, I think she I think she could get Batgirl. Um, not, like, I don't know if Lindsay Lohan, the way she's perceived, could get Batgirl. But, like, at, at her age, yeah, she could definitely get it because... Um, the, there are many versions of, of the Batgirl story that could be told. Uh, Batgirl is not always portrayed as a teenager. In fact, in the comics, currently she's not a teenager. She's post Oracle. She's post the killing joke. And that's a version they could do. Batman in the movies is old. He's in his Mm -hmm. mid forties and that, you know, we don't know what his history is, but it could mean that he has already had Batgirl that, that Barbara Gordon already went through that stuff did she go through the killing joke um we don't know uh has she just been active as batgirl the entire time we don't know but i do think that there's a very very interesting story there that to me personally and i would love to hear your guys thoughts but i would personally 
given the structure of the DC uh, film universe, I would most like to see a Batgirl who is mid to late 20s. Uh, that is post, not necessarily killing joke, but post retirement because some, maybe because of uh, the Joker killing um, Jason Todd or some, some trauma that caused her to stop. I, that That's the version of Batgirl that I would most like to see an older, more mature version of the character. Um, I think it fits with what they're doing right now, but uh, what do you guys think? I, I kind of want to see her as like a a younger Batgirl, just because I feel like you know their uh, her character. Um, I forget. I'm forgetting which which series it is. I think it was the Batman, um, where she's in it and like she's still trying to like, like learn everything. I feel like that's a really cool way. Not not necessarily needing the the trauma to build the story, but like having her just fit in come into the role um for me is cool i and i totally see like um her like post retirement like that that'll be a really cool story too so yeah like there, there's a multitude of ways you can portray this and approach this um but Lindsay, i don't know man yeah <laughs> i don't <laughs> i'm with you on that one um i hadn't thought about it that way sean i think you're right that within the context of the dc film universe as it is it actually i guess would make sense for there to be an older batgirl but um i think i'm with marco where i'd rather see her younger because like every superhero movie is about adult age superheroes except for spider-man and like i like teenage superheroes to to be fair to be fair though andrew garfield and toby Maguire. Uh, were both like 30 when they played Spider-Man. I mean now, though. Like, in the current climate. Yeah, no, I hear yeah. you. Um, But yeah, you're right. But I, I mean, I hated that. I hated that Andrew Garfield was playing, you know, supposed to be playing a kid in high school and he's in his late 20s. Like, Tobey Maguire at least played him as he was grad. He played a high school student for like five minutes. <laughs> um, But yeah, so I don't, I don't know. I, I, I was more against the idea of it until Sean added that context. So we'll see. It's Lindsay Lohan. Who, who cares? She's a fallen star. She is like Lucifer. That's unf- that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think unfortunately she and she and Charlie Sheen are in the same conversation. Conversation like I just like that. Oh, sucks. He's right. They co-starred but, in but, that but, shitty, scary movie Nineteen or whatever. Like they kind of are in the same category. Unfortunately, like it it sucks, but like that like. They did it to themselves. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. The one caveat I'll present is Robert Downey Jr. had a similar fall from grace in the 80s because he became a drug addict. And then he was able to turn his career around and with Iron Man and, you know, some other some other roles. So you never know. I I'm personally of the mind that uh, there is a level of the fact that because she's a woman, it's harder for her to shake um yeah her past and i don't think that's fair i'm i'm not like a lindsey lohan fan per se but i think if she's trying to rehab her career um she deserves an opportunity but to be fair from what i understand about robert downey jr uh and his comeback he worked like really really hard to get opportunities to try to um um, uh, audition and get rejected and all that different stuff and then Iron Man finally sorry Charlie Bartlett oh Charlie Bartlett is a great that was his movie. first movie back from being more or less blacklisted uh, it was like 2007 I think he played a recovering alcoholic in that movie and um, the kind of indie buzz that came from that film I think helped lead to Iron Man there you go. So she may have to do some some real legwork in terms of working on films that are smaller that you know allow her to showcase her skills because I don't know what kind of actress Lindsay Lohan is at thirty one. I have no clue. Yeah. So exactly. Well, and and I don't think there there's any reason for us to believe that that she has those chops unless she does something like Charlie Bartlett because like again look at the last few movies she's been in they've been schlock and she wasn't good in them like. You know, it's like, you don't do Scary Movie 9 and then get Batgirl. You know, like, Robert Downey, like you said, he put in work. You know, and like, Rob Lowe, he did television because he couldn't just go back and be a movie star. You know? Like, she should try to get a role somewhere where she can prove that she's still got chops. 
not say, oh, why don't they give me Mean Girls too? Because I was a drug addict a few years ago. It's like, well, that's why. Like, you haven't done anything lately, you know? Like, you got to get back out there. Yeah, I guess I just wish that the conversation around her wasn't so dismissive just because, you know, we didn't we didn't do that for some of these other people. I think you're right, though, that it is unfair that I think she has a, a, a more of an uphill battle because she's a woman because there are just less roles for older women in – and not that 31 is older. Sure. But there are, there are less roles for older women in Hollywood. So uh, I don't know that there's going to be additional developments on this one, but uh, uh, interesting nonetheless. Uh, what's also interesting is that we got some information from Diamond Comic Distributors about the unit sales um, uh, to comic shops for 2017. And I thought that there was a lot of information here that uh, is, is really, really interesting. So I wanted to kind of parse out some of this stuff and uh, see what our thoughts were. So uh, the top selling order, or I should say that the most ordered comic of 2017 was actually Marvel Legacy number one, which beat out DC Metal number one. And I personally am shocked by that fact because I thought that by far the answer would be Doomsday Clock, and that just wasn't the case. Right. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. When did Legacy come out, does it say? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Legacy came out in September, but... That's, um, that sounds right. Yeah. I'll try to find that for you while I'm looking through here. But the, there was some other information that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so Marvel had uh, 30, 38% of the uh, market share, while DC had 33% of the market share. Uh, Image came out uh, at number three at 10% of the market share. Yeah. And then from there, you've got IDW, you've got Dark Horse, Boom, Dynamite, uh, Titan. Um, and and the, but the percentages are just so low, you know. Um, it's like yeah, three or less probably on each of them. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, you got Valiant at point eighty seven percent, you know. Yeah. No, oh, they went up. Oh my God. <laughs> they went <laughs> they up. did. Like, uh, they that's did. actually a game that for them. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um. So that's that's pretty unfortunate. But here's here's where it gets really interesting to me. Um. Uh, so Marvel published one thousand. 124 comics this year, um, which is a lot. And when you compare it to how many comics DC published, DC published 989 this year. Um, and then when you include graphic novels, the total jumps up even more. Uh, Marvel published a total, like everything, of 1,608 comic comic book properties dc at 1396 image at 898 um yeah and uh, I, dark horse 417 total you know it's, it's it's very it's a very stark look at uh the industry and um Mar I mean, Marvel's publishing too many comics. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I guess, I guess it worked for them, right? They had the biggest market well, share. See, if if Marvel hadn't published so many more comics than DC, DC would have uh, had the greater um, number of sales. It's just that Marvel floods the market with stuff, and people try them, and then they don't like them, and then they get canceled. Like we've talked about many times, where these books, you know, they they come out and then they end up getting, you know can't um but marvel also had five of the top 10 selling issues of the year marvel legacy number one peter parker spectacular spider-man number one uh secret empire zero and one and phoenix resurrection the return of gene gray number one which i'm so happy to hear that's cool that that that, that yeah um that's a surprising one because everything else is like events and stuff right Exactly. But I guess that is an event because it's the return of a classic character. But still, it, that one was a it, surprise. It is an event, but it's an event. It's not a crossover event, you know. Uh, so it's kind of a different uh, different sort of event. Um, so, yeah, uh, Dark Knight's Metal, number one through four, and Doomsday Clock, number two, were all in the top five. So the one thing that I take away from this uh, is that Marvel's issues are all number ones. With the exception of Secret Empire, which is a zero. So that's like a, you know, same deal. Yeah. Also a number right. one. Whereas for DC, 
uh, people bought metal and then stuck with it. And then Doomsday Clock, it was the second issue that did better than the first, which you literally never hear. That never happens. Uh, so Probably because so many people were like hesitant to jump on and then they heard that number one was good. So they're like, all right, I'll get <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Saga dominated the, the, the graphic novels chart. Yeah. Um, it was eight of the top ten graphic novels. Well, I, Image had eight of the top ten graphic novel mm-hmm. spots. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very that's consistent. Not, yeah, that's not super surprising to me. Image is a very graphic novel friendly company. It's not surprising, but I just I love to hear it anyways. No, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's just good. It's reassuring. But I, I think it's also just because of how good their strategy is for selling graphic novels of that the first volume is always $10. It's like that's such an easy mm-hmm. sell. 10 bucks for six issues. Yeah. And then if you like it, you keep buying. It's $5 more. Okay. Yeah. I can and, deal with that. Um, Smart. I, I, I've also seen um, like just in general, the, the graphic graphic novels in general like come from the smaller presses anyway. Like there, that's much more where like their their sales come from. So you see a lot more. Um, like Archie's pops up sometimes there. Um, every once in a while, you get like a Dark Horse book. Um, the, the, so I, I wonder if also if that just speaks to the customer base and like the audience there. To some extent, you know. Yeah. Like the, no, I think I think that's true. Well, there are a couple factors here too. One of them is we just talked about monsters, right? Monsters mm-hmm. went on a severe hiatus. Yeah. Uh, that's common with image books in fact i think that i i could be speaking out of turn here but i believe it's something that is baked into several titles that they do yes, where it's yeah. like they'll do you know a certain amount of issues then take a break it's the saga model because saga started it back in 20 whenever 11 and like they so it's it's six issues two month or one month break and then six issues um, and so, like that—that's the schedule that a lot of image books in general, and like a lot of other publishers, have been picking up on. Um, That—that's just like a, yeah, a standard model for for image. There except, you go. Except so, for Marvel. Except for Marvel. But, but and, and so when you look at the way that Marvel and DC operate, it's very much more based on following the story week to week, month to month. Uh, you know. You don't really want to get left out of that conversation or not have the information that's about what's going on in those books. Whereas with Image, it's not really as important because they're very insular. Um, They don't have events. You know, they don't have things like that that force you to keep up with the grind. So it makes a lot of sense that people would be more willing to trade weight Image books, especially because they, they do have that time off sometimes and things like that. And quite frankly, several Image titles that I've personally read were better when all of it was done like mm-hmm. when you know yeah a lot of them are better as straight i mean like i do that right like i buy single issues but i a lot of times will sit on like three or four of them so i can read them in a you know in a um in one sitting as like the complete arc you know or to get that chunk of the next chunk of the story uh and to your point sean even when there are events in image books they're insular so like it's way it's not oh i need to pick up you know, Invincible and then Invincible this and that. And it's, oh, I could wait and then just get the entire event as one. Well, the event takes place is inside the story. In one you book. know, like Invincible. Yeah, like you, it's insular. Has, yeah. Totally. And, and that, it makes sense. I think it, it is probably better as trades, you know, like you buy the singles because you want to support the book. You want to see the trade get made. You know, that's how I do it anyway for a lot of these books. Any other take takeaways from this information. I'm a little disappointed that Image hasn't gotten more of that percentage. Ten's a great number for them, but they've been kind of stuck. I would have guessed more. Yeah. Mm-mm, yeah. The the most I think they've ever gotten is like maybe 11, 12. Wow. And that was like at the peak of like the new Image. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it also just has to do with the mod- their model in general and the way that they uh, what they consider success for an image book. Um, you know, like 40,000 copies is like huge for an image book. Um, whereas that's like, you can, you, you cancel a book at DC or Marvel for that. That's an excellent point. I, yeah, just to kind of add on to that, I was looking at, um, uh, as longtime listeners will know, my, my, uh, girlfriend Jess is an editor at, at Titan comics. And this week she was looking at the, the sales charts for stuff that wasn't mm-hmm. superhero comics. They they filter that stuff out specifically because Titan doesn't really deal with that stuff. And there were five titles that made over 10,000 sales outside of that. 
and the rest were like the rest were like you know in the in the single digit thousands um and like frankly most of titans sat at like five thousand and i was like really surprised yeah and we're gonna we're gonna talk more about stuff like that a little later in the main topic um but uh yeah that's that's stark you know that's like a that's a huge eye-opening uh figure there just like one last point on this i wonder if image didn't have if they didn't start adopting that more like lax kind of model that they got from saga like i wonder how many more comics they would have published this year and if that would have affected their bottom line in a significant way or if the breaks are more beneficial that's the kind of thing we really could never know unless they did like a b testing on it but um i'd be interested how many more comics would have come out if there weren't a three-month break for all of their best-selling titles you know like except walking dead which is like one of their only books that is actually monthly and is also significant. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was an interview with Brian K. Vaughn and then uh, I want to say Eric Stevenson where um, they mentioned that it the, the model, like originally it was totally like, we can't do this, this is impossible, you're crazy for even bringing this up. And I, the way it got adopted, they, they've been saying it's helpful for creators. It, it, it's, a, it's more helpful for creators then so the um the 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 publisher but in turn if it's if it's beneficial for the creators they'll produce better content they'll produce you know they'll they'll have that flexibility they'll have that sort of leeway to produce the book that they want to produce the content they want and to get the reception from the from audiences that that they deserve and i think you're going to track higher caliber talent yes. right like cuz if image didn't give saga that deal they would have went somewhere mm-hmm. else and then someone else would have yeah. saga and, you know, I think when it looks to them attracting people like Brian K. Vaughn or Brian Lee O'Malley, like people who have names and they could go somewhere and be like, hey, I made X, Y, and Z. Let me do my indie book here. Image has to be that place. If Image stops being that place, Image goes Yeah, under. yeah, definitely. You know, like that's what made them relevant again. So like having the more, you know, um, creator oriented mindset, letting them make the book on their time, on their schedule – if the book is good, that's fine. Yeah, Mar- uh, Marjorie Liu was a is a huge proponent of it. Like she she said, their process is you pitch them a book, they say okay, they give you times to have in scripts, and that's that's it. Yeah, and they pretty much leave you the hell alone. Yeah, you you ha- you have to follow up with Image and be like, hey, I have a draft. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's talk a little bit about Silver Sprocket. Uh, oh, this is cool. So uh, Silver Sprocket is. Uh, like a, a publisher slash art group um, based out of San Francisco uh, that has announced 12 new titles uh, that are coming out uh, over the spring and summer of 2018. Uh, so they say that they signed a quote unquote deal with the devil uh, in November <laughs> to have their books distributed by Diamond. Sounds about right. Which is, you know, the only game in town. And uh, a few of these books are pretty interesting. So, I want to just go over them and, uh, you know, you know, whatever, whatever stands out to you, just uh, speak your mind. Uh, Siren School by Isabella Rotman uh, is kind of a, well, the, the article that I'm reading from, which is from Bleeding Cool, uh, describes it as a funny, cathartic lesson in the murdering of mansplainers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Uh, the cover of it is like a, a teacher. Uh, who is a um, a mermaid, I guess. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, Please Destroy the Internet by Michael Sweater. Um, <laughs> Michael Sweater? Yeah. <laughs> that's a great name. <laughs> so it, it, it's it's actually a follow-up to a series called Please, Des- Please Destroy My Enemies. Um, and so it's, 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 I guess it's a book for people who dislike um, well, Bleeding Cool describes it as a book that will please anyone who hates Twitter, the government, or themselves. So it sounds oh. very millennial. Oh, shit. This is a book for me. <laughs> there you go. Um, there's a book called Your Black Friend and Other Strangers by Ben Passmore. Uh, this was probably the one that I was most interested in. Yeah, same. Um, 
Ben Passmore masterfully constructs comics about race, gentrification, the prison system, online dating, gross punks, bad street art, kung fu movie references, beating up God, and a lot of other grown-up stuff with refreshing doses of humor and lived relatability, earning an Eisner nomination, a Nats Award for Outstanding Comic, and a coveted spot on NPR's 100 Favorite Graphic Novels list. Nice. Uh, so wow. This sounds pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. This one actually drops February 2018, so right around the corner. It's like that. That's like a great example of my favorite things about comic books. I like how it's like here's all these big themes it, it deals with. Then also street punks and punching God. It's like yeah, all right. That sounds fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's also a uh, Passmore's uh, political cartoonist for Vice. Right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna skip around a little bit. They've got some 18 plus books that they put out. Um, it's for Murphy. So there's a book called No Better Words by Carolyn Nowak, uh, who I guess is a, a part of the creative team uh, behind Lumberjanes. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, cool. So it says uh, she uses magical realism and poetry to navigate lust, insecurity, and connection in this contemporary and classy smut adventure. That'll be out in March. Okay. So that's cool. Yeah, that sounds and, good. Um, and then they've also got... A book called Girls by Jen Woodall. The bold, colorful ways in which Woodall explores domestic violence, street harassment, and gender expression are wonderful, if at times painful. This book hits home because it doesn't shy away from any of the most dangerous aspects of being a woman. Nor does it shy away from the righteous fury with which most women have to live their daily lives, even when doing something as simple as going for a bike ride or taking a photo against the backdrop of a colorful brick wall. This sounds interesting to me, too, for sure. Yeah, this is cool. That language used to describe what are just normal everyday occurrences, like that sounds really interesting. Like that they're gonna kind of come at them with like it sounds like almost like a kind of horror vibe. Like, you know, that it's like I don't know. That that sounds really interesting. So uh there are a ton of other books that they've got. Like I said, there's twelve books. So uh, if you're interested, definitely click the link in the description and check these out for yourself. All these these are coming out this year, uh between apparently now and the summer, so Check them out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably pick up most of these. This is like a trend I don't think is sustainable in comics, but I'm very into this whole thing of like new collectives and micro pubs and all that kind of stuff, like jumping up to throw their hat in the ring and see if they can make something stick. I would say it's new. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's new, and I don't, I don't think it's unsustainable. I think that's the best part about comics. I mean, I'm just saying like when you look at the numbers we were just talking about, right, and like companies that we think of as like established like titan and stuff like that are moving single digit units it's not always necessarily emboldening i think for there to be like new blood in the space but like i'm not saying that it it can't work out i just you know i don't know how many of them can come up and actually be successful when the market is as small as it is well i but um that doesn't mean they shouldn't try i look at things like this as an opportunity to get your name out there and express yourself yeah yeah i think a lot of these creators probably are not doing this for the money um, and this is a great way to, hey, if they have aspirations for working for Image or getting one of these books transplanted over to Image or doing something brand new over there, this is stuff that they that they will notice, you know? Totally, totally. Especially when, uh, you know, they're winning Eisners and, you know, making all these kind of lists and stuff like that. That's a surefire way to get your next book funded. Yeah, so good for them. Uh, last week, we talked about the... Uh, questionable at best relationship between Kitty Pride and Colossus. Uh, and coincidentally, <laughs> sorry? Questionable, Sean? Uh, very questionable, I, although I mean, yeah. not, not questionable to Marco, apparently, <laughs> which we don't all watch anime, causes Marco, me sorry. to have questions about Marco. Uh, however, Marvel is foregoing all the questions that we might have and just having these two kids get hitched because. Um, Kitty Pride and Colossus are going to get married in X-Men Gold number 30. Uh, so in June, Mark Guggenheim and Paulo Seguera will be presenting to us the wedding of the century. And everyone knows that in comic books, weddings never go wrong. So we can expect this to go off without a hitch. Marco. What what are your feelings about this? Um, Sean, was that sarcasm when you meant like this wouldn't n- nothing these marriages go off without a hitch? Because frankly, this is true love. This will be everything I've ever wanted. <laughs> um, this will be the best thing. I hope to see nothing but 
uh, I hope to see a spinoff of just Kitty and Colossus living like their lives. I'd read that book. Yeah, I probably would. The slice of life. Yeah, uh, man. The That'd marriage. Be sick. The marriage and life of Colossus and Kitty Pride. That yeah, yeah that that would be pretty good actually. <laughs> I think I think that the 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 implication there is is not that they won't get married. It's that something's gonna happen during the wedding. Right. right, right. Oh no! Magneto stole the key. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That would be the best thing that could happen at that wedding. <laughs> After a wedding ceremony, they're gonna find a snake in the cake, and it's gonna turn out to be Jake the Snake Roberts sabotaging it. It's gonna be a massive disaster. <laughs> Trust me, Phil. That would be cool. Uh, so moving right along, it's been a long road, but, uh, the Dan Slott era on Amazing Spider-Man is at an end as Dan Slott has announced that he will be leaving Amazing Spider-Man, uh, after 10 years and 189 issues, his run will end with June's Amazing Spider-Man 801 and he will move on to take over Iron Man. Man, he's not even gonna stick it out to two hundred, a hundred and eighty nine issues. Like I, I did you did you hear his explanation for why? No. So uh, it's actually really funny. He talks about how he had all these different sort of benchmarks in mind. Uh, you know, like if he got to a certain point, then X would be the case. So let me just read from his words. If I make it this far, I get to one out of every five issues of. The Amazing Spider-Man ever published, meaning that he's written one out of every five issues of Spider-Man. That's insane. Um, if I get it to this far, I get to issue 700 and so on. So I, ha- I kept having these benchmarks to hit. And then I realized once you hit 10 years and then issue 800, the next benchmarks were way too far away. So I always knew that was the zone. Anyone who follows my Instagram account every now and then, I would put these cryptic numbers from my whiteboard. This running tally of which that tally starts in like July 10th of 2014, where I knew what I was counting down to and no one else knew what I was counting down to. I wanted to lock that in so that I could prove I wasn't lying. Which is so Dan Slot. That's so random that you would say that you're doing it to prove you're not <laughs> lying. No one cares. Um, but in the interview with Vulture, uh, Slot says that if he knew that Bendis was leaving Marvel, he would have stayed on Spider-Man because Bendis actually has written the most Spider-Man books ever because of Ultimate Spider-Man. Uh, and because his run with Miles Morales is ongoing – or at the time was ongoing, Slot had no way to know that it would ever end. And he did not believe he would ever be able to surpass Bendis on Spider-Man. And so now that Bendis is leaving, Slot's like, well, damn, can I get a run on like Web of Spider-Man in a couple years so I can just like <laughs> write 20 <laughs> issues and jump out and take that from, from uh, Bendis? I just thought that was so funny. But that was really Even funny. still, just like 11 <laughs> issues to hit that even 200, you know? Just that's it. That's all you need. Just listen, 11 issues – Close everything out. Put Peter Parker back. Like, Well, he talks about how hard it was to do the Spider-Verse uh, crossover and how that really was kind of like the last straw in terms of, you know, he explains, and I thought this was an interesting look into the industry. He explains that with Spider-Man, you can't have delays, that Marvel will not allow that. And so when they were working on Spider-Verse, which was this huge crossover with several different artists who work at different speeds, it was very difficult to keep all of that together and avoid a delay on a book that's super popular. And so it kind of shows that they, they're they more willing to allow delays on certain titles than others. And he kind of wanted to get away from working on the flagship title for, for Marvel. Also, he's been doing it for so fucking long. Yeah. You know, like, how do you write a character for 10 years and like, still have I, I i'm sure he could keep going if he wanted to right but it's like i can understand the desire to do something for else. sure yeah yeah like i i personally um especially with uh his silver surfer run and how like personal that was to him like i would love to see a creator own book from him uh at this point i don't think i, I don't think we'll ever get that I, I agree with you i'd like to see it don't think we'll ever get it um but Reading the interview with Vulture, it's very clear that he understands Spider-Man on a fundamental level. And I know that a lot of people have made the argument, including Pete, that that's not the case or that Dan Slott did a lot of things with Spider-Man that were against what a lot of people believe to be their Spider-Man. 
Sure, yeah, I just want to clarify, right? Because Pete's like, very upset. We're going to end up talking about this. No, no, listen, like, I know that my dislike of his run is, like, we've memified it at this point. Like, it's 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 true I dislike his interpretation of the character. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see him move on for his own sake. I'm also glad to see the book in someone else's hands because it has been so long, and I have disliked his interpretation. Um, but, you know, I don't, like... I, I'm not arrogant enough to be like he doesn't understand Spider Man, and I, you know, I do. It's just I didn't like what he did with the character. You know, I, I think a lot of the choices he made are things I wouldn't have done, and they're things that I didn't think made sense for the character, which is why he lost me as a reader. You know, but like you, the guy wrote one fifth of Spider Man issues, so it, to ignore his interpretation would be arrogant. Yeah, um, and. It's also clear to me that Dan Slott really is passionate about Iron Man, and that gives me hope for that series when that does start. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Well, I mean, he already turned Peter into Iron Man, so I guess it makes sense for him to pick it up, right? I'm back, baby! <laughs> Boo! I'm okay with what just happened. <laughs> I don't understand the reference, so. Marco doesn't read Marvel books. I don't read comics, Phil. Marco hates superheroes unless they're statutorily written. Okay. Each other. That was that was a fair joke though. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh <laughs> so the Venom movie that we have uh talked about in the past but avoided talking Dear about. Oh hell was, yeah. <laughs> um There's it's Phil. back in the news. No, Phil, you have to hate it now. It's back in the news because Collider's John Schnepp, I believe that's how you say his name. Uh, spoke on one of their podcasts about the fact, according to him, that Tom Holland would appear in the movie. Now, when he first talked about this, uh, he, I don't want to say he made it seem like, but the assumption was that Spider-Man would appear in the movie, that Peter Parker would appear in costume within the Venom film. And he's unwilling to say whether it'll be a cameo or an after credit scene or what exactly it's going to be like when he's talking on the podcast. Um, but he does insinuate very clearly that Peter Parker will be in the movie. Uh, and then, of course, the Internet took that and ran with it. And um, Kali- uh, John went on uh, the Heroes podcast to speak more about this and clarify that he was referring to Peter Parker himself appearing in the movie. Uh, So now the following is a quote from John. Tom Holland was on set filming scenes on Venom at least two days as Peter Parker. I'm not saying that Spider-Man is in the film. When I say that Tom Holland's Spider-Man is in the film, I'm saying Peter Parker is in the film. This is a cameo. Uh, I'm not going to say that anyone was lying when they said Spider-Man is not in Venom, because probably Spider-Man is not in Venom. Peter Parker is in Venom. Now, that opens up a huge um, box of questions, because everything that we've heard prior to this is that they're separate, that the universes are separate, that Venom and Silver and Black and whatever the hell other movies Sony decides to make do not take place within the MCU. Uh And this doesn't necessarily mean that they do, which is the craziest part of this whole thing, because Tom Holland's existence in the MCU does not necessarily uh, keep him from being in the Sony films. But I do think that the opposite is true or or that. Yeah, I I do think the opposite is true. I think that Venom cannot appear and Silver Sable and Black Cat cannot appear in the MCU films. But I don't think that that means that that Tom Holland cannot appear in the Sony films because I believe that the that this is an agreement between the two that is giving them Spider-Man only. So and then whatever characters they work out for whatever films, right? So this is so crazy and I'm just wondering how this is going to play out. What do you guys think? I I bet it's going to be like a family picture of like the Brock family and the Parker family and we're going to see <laughs> Tom Holland in, you know, standing with Eddie Brock and they're both giving the the kiddo yeah, thumbs yeah. up and Tom Holland was on set for a day to take a picture yeah. <laughs> a selfie with Tom Hardy. Uh, I just, I just wish this movie wasn't coming out. You know, I don't, 
what I, like I'm not excited by this. Like it's gonna be confusing to casual audiences. I think this movie's gonna be bad for reasons that are unrelated to this. Like this does not excite me. It just it's just more like what even is this movie? Cool. Like, I'm pumped. Let's go. I'm ready. Too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> Phil, Phil only likes crossovers with the MCU when they That's trigger me. More or less true. <laughs> my, my only concern is, um, Sean, do we have to watch this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's do it. I don't know yet. I know we have to. We have do, to. Do we? We have to because don't you want to be on a podcast where I lo- scream until I lose well, no, my mind? No, definitely no. not. <laughs> but we'll watch it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I think this is very interesting. I think that uh what they actually end up doing with this movie is going to be like it, i mean it's not even a matter of could it be good or not it's a matter of like what does this mean for the future of the crossover between sony and uh marvel there are rumors that um the homecoming sequel is looking to cast a femme fatale obviously that leads you to think of black cat so if black cat is in homecoming then that opens things up even further. So I like at this point, it's like who even knows what they're doing. Um, but it's kind of it, it's interesting. It's interesting. Disney's probably just gonna buy Sony at this point. Hey, why not? That'd be fucking God. awful. Let's hope. Let's hope. Hey, but we get Spider Man and Venom. <laughs> yeah, I only care about superficial shit. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna jump into our main topic here. Um, and that is the fact that the comic book industry is stuck in the Stone Age. And I believe that, you know, within the next, I don't know, however many years, could be facing extinction if certain things don't change. Um, now, this was, this line of thinking was spurred on by uh, Greg Pak on Twitter, who posted a series of tweets regarding the fact that the pre-order system for comic books is basically archaic and needs to change. So I just want to read a few of his tweets and get us into, you know, into the conversation and then we'll we'll take it from there. Uh, So this is what he said on Twitter. Comics publishers and Diamond, please invest money into building a website that lets readers pre-order and prepay for upcoming comics from their local shops. If folks could do this online with a click, thousands more would actually do it. All this frantic tweeting we do about pre-orders is critical, but so inefficient. We live in a world in which 90, 99% of people won't do anything unless it can happen in one click. Pre-orders now require phone calls or printing and filling out forms or visiting shops in person. God bless each and every one of you who has ever pre-ordered any of my books. You are the greatest. You make it all possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But man, we need to make it easier for you. In 2018, I'm going to make a special effort to find comic shops that allow you to pre-order books online and include links when I talk up my books. At TFAW does this. And then he goes on to talk about uh, different stores that do do this. <clears throat> um, which is fan- it's fantastic there, that there are stores that do this. Uh, but not enough do. Uh, and his idea is something that it's actually shocking that that it doesn't exist i personally when doing you know when thinking this through never i realized that i never considered this to be an issue uh part of it is because midtown comics is the uh comic book chain that's based in new york where i shop hydra comics they allow you to i'm gonna ignore that because that's (laughs) uh, yeah and also like they have every single comic that's out almost every week so i I mean hell yeah and the comics industry uh, whatever i was about to go on a whole (laughs) (laughs) oh my god damn marco's a villain no he's just you're a bad influence on him phil um (laughs) shut they they don't have this right yeah the system that greg pack is talking about what you can do with midtown comics is actually phenomenal you can uh, not only can you pre-order, but you can actually set up a, a home delivery system where they will send your books to you weekly. Uh, it's it's really great um, and very comprehensive. I don't have that. I never enabled that, but it's something that anyone can do, and it doesn't cost you any more money. I think I, there's a there's a minimum order. You have to 
your weekly pull list has to equate to twenty dollars or more, I believe. Okay. Which reasonable you know, makes sense. I, I would say that's that's pretty that's Yeah, pretty that's not fair, hard. Especially when most, you know, Marvel books are four dollars and you know, stuff like that. So um but Anyway, Greg Pak goes on to talk about, uh, check out this quote from Diamond's Roger Fletcher in this at McLaughlin article from October. This is very exciting, and I can't wait to see what it looks like. And so he posts an image from the article. Previewsworld.com has a search that allows consumers to see what's coming out this week, this month, or to search by genre and other factors. We're not there yet, but we're close to allowing the consumer to place an order with a retailer of their choice. We see this as an upgrade for the e-commerce age. That's awesome. That's really great. But here's the problem. It is 2018. And... The comic book industry's major, you know, uh, distributor being Diamond, only, you know, gathering the technology, being close to having the technology to do this in 2018 is shockingly ridiculous considering that Barnes & Noble has had this forever. Uh, the video game industry, every every major uh, retailer in video games allows you to pre-order. In fact, in the video game industry, pre-ordering is a huge thing, and they incentivize pre-ordering by giving you bonuses for doing so. And it's amazing to me that comics have not jumped on this yet, and it's only happening now. And I think that what Greg Pak is talking about is a huge reason why people don't uh, engage with comics more, because it is so hard to be a comic book fan. It's hard to jump in. It's not it's not terribly hard to stay in, but it's hard to jump in and buying comics is cumbersome. Very cumbersome. And expensive. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is the absolute truth. I think about it from my perspective. Um I have a hard time getting into TV shows and video games that are or in a long series like Game of Thrones widely popular in five or six seasons or whatever. Breaking Bad, video games that are generally going to be 50 plus hours of time commitment, right? It's the same thing with comic books that are already deep and enthralled. They run. I'm personally very involved with like how the comic industry operates on a week to week basis, just because it's a passion of mine. But if that's not a passion of yours and you're trying just to get into this industry, you don't know where to start. And if it's something that's deep and like, if it's something that's deep in a run, that's intimidating. Yeah. I, I even think it goes deeper than that, too, of that, like, the primary place to get comics is at a comic book store, and comic book stores are intimidating. Like, if yeah. you have a good local shop, that's awesome, right? Like, the shop that, um, shout out to the comic book store in uh, Glassboro, New Jersey, where I went to college, uh, is a great store for new readers. Everybody who works there is really nice. Um, they like when new people come in, they try to talk to you about your interests and recommend books to you. It's a very relaxed environment. They have like game nights and stuff there. So it's, it, they've built a community that is like built on the fact that they are constantly new freshmen, new students coming in who hopefully will get interested in comic books. And if you don't have that kind of shop, like my local store is, is, uh, or one of my local stores is not new reader friendly at all. They don't talk to you when you come in. They expect that you know what you're there for. You're going to come and get it, buy your shit and leave. And if that's this, that's your experience going into a shop and you're a total novice and somebody doesn't try to initiate you, it's scary. And a lot of comic book fans are mean and will treat you like an asshole if you are a casual reader or you are a new reader. And that's not an incentive. You know, we talk about this on the video game, pals. I think that's, the, you know, just last week we were talking about why aren't there more professional female players, right? It's because if there's a toxic environment that turns you off at your first encounter, why would you go back? Yeah. For, further anecdotal evidence at my job, um, one of the engineers I was talking to, and he was a huge comic reader in the 1980s. His favorite character is Captain America, and he was reading Steve Englehart run in the 80s, which is which was arguably the best Captain America run until Ed Brubaker came along. And he's he you know stopped reading when the bubble burst in like 97 or whatever, and honestly, that's a lot of quality books. A lot of books, the quality was diminishing anyway, but circa you know civil war he was trying to get back in the industry and that was a great time to start reading captain america comics again and his local comic book shop owner 
like he went in, asked a couple questions, and he described him as being the stereotypical comic book guy, like from The Simpsons. And he just turned around and walked out. And that was a potential like relapse reader to get back into reading comics. Yeah. Um. And, and going going back to something uh to what Sean said about just like not having a system. Uh, the other day I picked up uh, yesterday I picked up um some books from my local comic shop, um, Mysterious Time Machine, and I I asked him like, oh hey by the way like. Uh, I know we usually order through pull list. So like, what are you going to, what, like what's going to happen there? Like, how do we have through like, the comicsology pull list? Like, like what's going to happen? He's like, yeah, we don't really know. We're sort of figuring that out. Like they, 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 they don't even have a backup system it, in case they just sort of put all their eggs in that one basket. And now they're basically screwed with their pre-orders. Cause he's like, it's probably just going to go, have to go back to what we were doing before, which was like an email and a phone call. Like that, that's, that's the best that they can do right now. Um, which, which sucks for, for these smaller places that don't have, like he, he's trying to figure it out, but they don't have the money to like pay for somebody to produce like a sort of, sort of list for them so they can like some sort of system. Um, cause they are a smaller place. So, uh, it's definitely a problem. Uh, and one that I've, uh, been like frequently uh, i like i've been I, i've been uh aware of it and like i've I, I don't i can't think of like a fix for it it's weird well i think reg Pak himself provides the fix he he says it in his initial tweet which is comic publishers and diamond please invest money into building a website that lets readers pre-order and prepay for upcoming books from their local shops listen the fact that the comic book industry The entire basis of the industry is that people will go to stores that they don't know about that are run by people who are just regular mom and pops and go and buy books is outrageous. It's stupid. It's antiquated. There's yeah, there's no reason why in 2018 that should be the way we're doing things. People don't do that. And it's obvious that they don't do that because 50 comic book shops, according to Bleeding Cool, closed in 2017 uh which is a huge number if barnes and noble closed 50 stores everyone would be talking about it that's a Mm -hmm. big number you know yeah you can't just close 50 stores and if you look at those stores as parts of a bigger chain which is the chain is the comic book industry that's a massive blow yeah you can't you can't ignore how big of a blow that is yeah like what happens if there isn't like especially like imagine you live in like a rural area right like you live in virginia there's one comic book store that's within driving distance of you and it closes you're done you're not reading books anymore. that's that's what happened in my hometown in uh amarillo the the headquarters of a, a company called hastings uh had been around since you know the 70s had spread all throughout like the you know the the south belt of of the u.s and uh, they just went bankrupt a couple of years ago and and closed it, and it was like it was like one of the shining crowns of Amarillo, and they were one of the only places that uh, sold comics in like Muskogee, Oklahoma, and you know I I made a lot of really good acquaintances you know working at that Hastings in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and you know working on the comics there, and it's just gone now. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I'm privileged enough to go to Midtown where it's not a it's not a problem. I'm never going to have to worry or I mean, who knows? Maybe I will one day. But like for the time being, they seem to do really well for themselves and they're not in danger of closing. But that's not everyone else's experience. In fact, I would say that's a minority experience. I I would agree. And I I think one of the things that speaks to me is like and you guys can maybe speak to this too a little bit, right? Like if you look at all the stores in my area, they've they've diversified their offerings. You know, like the the comic book store I mentioned in Glassboro, they own two stores that are next to each other, and one is primarily about tabletop games. And that's a huge part of their business. You know, it's that like it started as a comic book store and then they started selling games and trading cards to survive. You know, and like they're doing well now, but comics are a significantly smaller part of their business. And um you know, like uh, the record store that I took you guys to in Howell, New Jersey, they sell records, they sell statues, they sell, you know, all kinds of shit that's not just comics. And I feel like there are a lot of shops like that. Andy's local store, Andy from the Video Game Pals, they just opened a bar inside their comic book shop, you know, and 
and that's awesome. It's awesome. But I honestly think we're going to get to a point pretty soon where comic book stories are going to become a more niche thing than they already are. And that it's going to be about the boutique experience of going to a place where you can connect with other fans more so than it is about even being a place for you to go and buy books. Which is like foreign to me. I have literally never struck up a conversation with anyone at a comic book store unless they were like ringing me up. I've never just been like, really? hey, what books you read? No, hell no. I, I, I like – in specifically with attending Midtown Comics, it's like going to shop for jeans. You walk in, <laughs> you know what you need, and if you don't, you try stuff out because you just stand there and like look at it real quick. You buy your stuff and you leave. You know, like I, yeah, I think I think Sean and I are are, are sort of very similar in our in our sort of shopping yeah. tastes. It sounds like where hey, you know what? I got it. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> I don't like need the, help. Uh, the Ron Swanson thing. The Ron Swanson thing when he goes into Home Depot and the guy comes up to him and he goes, oh, hey, how can I help you? I know more than you. (laughs) But it's like those people that do help, they're critical. Um, Absolutely. Because the 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 comic book reader like we run we run the gamut right like there's so many different kinds of us the people that are new need that help a lot i don't need help um and not only do i not need help i really don't want to talk to you that you know to be honest um (laughs) so like there's a lot there's a lot of different people whose needs need to be served and the fact that there's no like one size fits all way that they deal with this stuff is crazy look at check it out for example any video game that comes out pretty much, or at least let's just say like major releases, they always have something that is a pre-order exclusive for a specific store. GameStop, Best Buy, Amazon, they always have a pre-order exclusive that only they have for the most part. Why is there not something like that for comics? How come Marvel and DC don't do something for the stores that support them? There has to be more. And it doesn't need to be in the form of something that the stores pay for. Why do they have to pay more to get the lenticular covers? Give the stores the lenticular covers at the same rate because that will inspire people to go to the store and buy it. Maybe that's the only way you can get the lenticular cover is if you physically go. Maybe they don't allow you to buy those if you pre-order the books or, or buy them online. There has to be some way to incentivize people operating with the stores. On top of that, how come Marvel and DC haven't figured out a way to get together and offer a pre-order system that encompasses these different stores that allows you to buy the books online and then go to the store and pick them up. Not every store is going to be able to afford to run a system like that. Man, I hate to say it. I don't understand how Amazon hasn't done this yet. Like when they bought Comixology, I thought this is the direction we were going. Cause like, I, I honestly, like I love comic book stores. I love going to my local shop. I'm the kind of person, I don't necessarily talk to other fans, but I like talking to the, sh- the shop owners that I've developed a relationship with. Right? Like, however, that's not how people buy things in 2018. People don't go to brick and mortar stores and they expect someone to go to a store to pre-order a book and then go again to pick it up is ridiculous. And the fact that there isn't like that Amazon hasn't stepped in and been like, hey, we'll undercut everybody and give you discounts for pre-ordering or free this or free that. I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. And I think it is going to happen. It's going to be about who figures it out first. And I, I think uh, sadly, it might not come until comic book stores are such a rarity that they're not savable. Well, uh, in that vein, uh, someone responded to Greg Pak, who I guess owns or operates the Comic Hub website, comichub.com. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And comichub.com does exactly what we're talking about. They, 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 this is the only time I've ever seen something this comprehensive where you can literally choose the book and then it shows you which stores have the book that you're looking for and you can set up an order with them. Now, I tried this and uh, I wanted to see what would happen. So I actually looked and um, the book that I found was I, I you, you can search by writer. So I looked at Akira Yoshida. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I looked at <laughs> <You> fucking fiend. 
because because like the website loads loads super super slow right and like i couldn't get through the a's before i got annoyed so i i was like looking at the a's and i was like what what writer can i think of and i was like oh akira yoshida so i looked at akira yoshida they've got one literally one book available it's thor son of asgard graphic novel so then what you do is you you see the book that you're looking at and you click available at right and then it takes you to a map and it shows you where the book is available where can you pre-order it from where can you order it from and there's literally one place on the entire map of the world that this book is available according to this website and it's in new zealand <laughs> nice there you go. where uh it's at a store called heroes for sale and the website is uh, www.heroes.co.nz, uh, and it's in Auckland. Okay, yeah, that's. I mean, that's the that's the the big city in the north. Yeah. So there you go. I just wanted to do that as an experiment for myself to see what this website was about, and uh, that was the that was the I'm, reaction. I'm gonna go buy that book. CB Sobolski is getting <laughs> do it. That would he's be getting a fucking check from me. That's hilarious. Please, um, can you please, can you please actually do that and videotape the entire thing? Because that would be listen, amazing. I'm gonna do it. Do it, please. But, Vlog it. But so this website, I want to say, like, I appreciate what they're doing, but this website's very slow. Um, it's just, it's not where we need to be. You know, this is obviously done by you know someone or a group of people or whatever who really understand the need. For this kind of this kind of thing, but they don't have the resources to get it done. Diamond does, Marvel does, DC does. They need to get their stuff together. Yeah, and and going going back to what uh, Sean you had mentioned, just in terms of um, like not having uh, uh, why why haven't like Marvel or DC like done this? Well, I I think it's because like all of it goes through directly to Diamond. So diamond, I feel, is the like the culprit in, in, in this more so than like the the companies because they they have the, they have their publishing list right. But if everybody's ordering from diamond already, uh, diamond has been reluctant to set this sort of thing up. They they, they have everything. They, they they have a partnership with Previews World. Like they're the ones that publish the books, right? So y- you would think that they would do something with this. So I, I feel like more so that's where the problem lies. Let me um, let me stop you for a second, Marco. They're the ones that distribute the book. They're not oh, the ones yeah, that sorry, publish yeah, it. They're sorry. the ones that distribute it. Right, right. So like they have, if anything, they have not only the the, the understanding of the sales numbers, but they also have the understanding of how many, uh, who is ordering what book, uh, what store. You know, they they have all this extensive, um, just information, just by operating. But for whatever reason, don't implement something to process this thing. These things. Then, then what that tells me is that Marvel and DC are complicit in not demanding that Diamond get on the ball. It's 2018, right, guys. When I started reading comic books, uh, gosh, like 13, 14 years ago, I used to, I used to like mail order them from Marvel. Like that's how I started reading. I used to, I had the subscription. That was awesome. I never went to a, I didn't go to a comic book store for like a year after I started reading comics. I read comics for a year before I ever went to a store because I didn't have to. And I'm not saying that that's not like an experience you should have, but maybe it's not. Maybe it doesn't matter whether or not you go to a store. You shouldn't have yeah. to. That's the thing. It's an experience I think you should have, but if you don't want that experience, that sh- you should have the option to not do it. Like you need to. I'm sorry. I, didn't no, I was just going to say it's crazy that in that in this day and age, they're still forcing you to go to a store to pick up books. And then what happens? What happens is that people go to websites like Amazon, like CheapGraphicNovels.com, and they buy their books through there and the local comic book shop loses that sale. Because you don't want to have to go to Midtown Comics, get off your butt, and go to the store and pick it up. So Amazon, not only will they send it to you, but they'll send it to you fast, and it'll be cheaper. And there's no reason not to do that. Well, and and the the way it is currently also ignores people who just can't go. Like, what if you're somebody like Phil, where, like, you work two jobs, and you're working at night, and you don't have the opportunity to go to the comic book store on Wednesday to get your new shit, and then you show up two days later, and it's gone. You know, like I've had that problem where like even, you know, I remember with Void Trip, I uh, I tried to pre-order every issue of it and my local comic book store wouldn't do it for me. 
they were just like, no, we're going to get enough. People aren't going to pick that book up. It's a small image book. Like, you'll be fine. We always get enough of everything. And it went. And then I was like, well, I don't now I have to go hunt for it. And that, that that's annoying. You know, and the fact that there isn't an alternative is ridiculous. It's an archaic system. And I also think, honestly, like, again, like, I believe in physical comics and comic book stores and all that stuff. I don't mean to uh, attack those people or those that industry because it's was been very important to me as a comic fan. However, Marco and I have said this time and time again on the show, the fact that digital comics are so behind, too, that's, I think, going to be more of the death march of the industry. Is that, like, realizing that, like, people want digital products, not physical ones, like... If there was a better system for you to buy digital comics and it was more affordable or it was uh, quicker or any – take your pick. Um, the, the fact that no one has optimized that system is, I think, a failing of the industry to not modernize. I'm telling you, I thought when uh, Comixology was bought by Amazon, I thought that would be it. Um, Me because too. I, and, I, I don't and think I, it can no, no, no. be. No, I, th- I think we're talking about different things. I thought Comixology would go under. Uh, because oh, because the oh, app okay, itself okay. was so intuitive and it was so just easy. Now you have to actually go to the website and you can't buy things uh, on the app. It just like it's it's like they broke it. Like that whole system yeah, they made, they it, made worse. it worse. And and they, Amazon got rid of Polis like as well. They they're they're working backwards if anything. Uh, so like. I, you know, yeah, as far as the digital comics go, like there, there's been a big step backwards, like Comixology Unlimited and Marvel Unlimited are decent, you know? Yeah. Uh, I th- the Marvel. decent's the operative word. <laughs> yeah. Marvel Unlimited could definitely use some work, Marvel, uh, but they're not, they're, they're not what they should be. But even, even then, even then, why does it have to be? That you that Marvel has to have their own service and DC has you know like why can't there just be the one service why why does it have to be spread out it doesn't make any sense like I like I understand that there's there's money aspects and and stuff like that but do you want your industry to die or not you know like to me it's that simple. To me, that's why they should have their own, though. It's like, I agree with you that they shouldn't have to, but if the fact that Diamond isn't, it's their fault for not. Like No, 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 no. Marvel and DC can work out with Image and all the other publishers some kind of technology that will allow them to have their own Netflix. And you shouldn't have to get 7,000 different things to be able to read everything you want in one place. It should all be in one place. It should be comprehensive. It should be excellent. It should be a subscription or a pay what you want. I don't care. You guys can work that's that what out. That's what comicsology you know, should be. But like, like, there there should be a system in place that mimics what works in the other entertainment industries. Yeah, but I I would say, like, to that point, I agree with you, but I think even so, I think even if the answer to that was every major publisher has their own service that's actually good and, like, because that's the thing, right? Marvel Unlimited is, like, almost good, but, like, if you want to read every new Marvel series the week it comes out, they don't do that, right? Like, it's not updated as soon as they come out. That's deliberate. They come a little... Right, That's and that's my point, is you can't... As long as you have a system that is prioritizing physical sales that are dwindling, you're fucking up. Like, if there are people that want to buy day and date from just you, Marvel, you should give them that option. Because Comixology was that option, but to Kale's point, they ruined it. You used to be able to buy the book, and if you liked it, you could literally push a button and buy the next issue without stopping. And just go right to the next one. That's smart. That's how you sell fucking issues. And the fact that Marvel and DC... At the very least, don't do that themselves is dumb. And and the issue should be cheaper. There's no reason I, sh- I should spend $3 for a digital copy of a book that is exactly the same as the physical ones. Like, that doesn't make sense. And I know that it's because of deals and you don't want to undercut people and that's how it works. But, like, sales are down, man. Like, even if it was we did more digital sales. Like, there need you need to be able to give people comics however they want to buy them at, at any opportunity. Your, like you, your idea would murder the comic in this, the comics industry. Yeah, there yeah. there are creator issues there, obviously. But I, I mean, you're you are right. But yeah, there there would have to be some major, like creator um, payment issues, and and you know, yeah, 
And that's a problem. Yeah, and that's a huge we've, problem. We've done this podcast for over a year at this point, and it's insane how often we have to come back to this 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 fact time and time and again how these multi-million dollar industries are so archaic in their way of delivering to their customers. Um, on the one hand, it's true that DC on a content level is cognizant of how to appeal to their readership. That's true. They've taken great strides in that regard. But from a publishing standpoint, these companies are so behind the eight ball. It's insane. Honestly, like how is a multi-million dollar company this tone deaf? Yeah, and 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 it also goes back to something we've just we've talked about in general is that the the way that these companies prioritize comics, it's it's not a priority. So like that affects just everything in the in the blockchain as well. But it it it, it never has been, too, is the thing. It's like when Marvel wasn't owned by DC or wow, when Marvel <laughs> wasn't owned by Disney, uh, they still didn't have their stuff together. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah, I, I Diamond yeah, hasn't. I wasn't even thinking about it from the perspective of their parent company. I was thinking from like, oh, okay, yeah, just the just yeah. DC yeah. comics, no, no, right. and Marvel comics. Yeah, but to Sean's point, distribution for comics hasn't changed since like 1992. Since like the the direct market evolved and comic book stores became a relevant again and b allowed for. Uh, independent publishers like Image and a bunch of others who have unfortunately gone under uh, to thrive. And literally since then, like, there's been almost no change in the way that comics are sold. And that's insane. That's over 25 years ago when when we had that change. It was in the late 80s yeah. when, when the direct market was introduced. Guess what didn't exist back then? You know? Uh, you didn't, the fucking internet? Yeah. You, well, you know, like, <laughs> it, you didn't have... Everyone didn't have access to computers. Everyone didn't have access to the internet. You didn't have smartphones that you carry with you everywhere you go. You couldn't read a, a comic book on anything other than paper. Paper. Yeah. <laughs> like that was it. That was all there was. And now that's not true. So get it together. And I, I think, frankly, there are people who prefer reading them digitally, too. And the fact that, like, there isn't more catering to what could be a growing audience instead of saying, oh, if we prioritize it. And, you know, this is, I'm just speculating here, right? But. Maybe you could grow a new audience that only reads comics digitally instead of cannibalizing the ones that already read physical. I don't think that if you make a better digital system, everyone's going to necessarily switch over because like I know some of you guys have expressed you never read comics digitally because you don't like it. And I don't think that that's going to change. But there is a whole new generation of readers out there that grew up reading on Kindles or on their phone or whatever, and they don't they don't have that problem. So like try to sell to them. You it's, know, it's, like it's, figure out the right way. It's not a one or the other thing is the problem. It has, yeah, it has to, be, to be both. It, you, you can't kill one fan base to grow another. That won't work. It has to be that both systems are equally maintained and managed properly. You have to offer um, better systems for physical readers. You, ha you just you just do. At the same time, you have to offer better systems for digital readers. This is something that the the industry, the movie industry, figured out with DVDs, uh, and the fact that people want to be able to just download the movies and not have to go to a damn store to buy the the DVD. Um, and, and when you buy a DVD, uh, they come with the digital version as a as a free download, as an additional download. Um, this is something that the gaming industry has figured out that you now can download the game through your system. In, in, in many cases, you can just, you know, jump on your PS4. And if you want to download uh, the new Dragon Ball Z game, you'll just be able to download it on there. You know, like, why is the comics industry lagging so far behind? Do you guys want it to die? That's what it that's that's the question that we're now faced with. And I think to a point you brought up earlier, Sean, the way the way in my mind is you incentivize people to buy physical copies and whether that's, oh, you went and pre-ordered, um, you know, Doomsday Clock number one. We're going to give you a, a nice enamel pin. That's the Superman thing, you know, with the clock that everyone was using as a promotional image. And that would be your incentive to go to the store and pre-order because you got a free thing that, yeah, it would cost them a little bit of money to make them. But like, God for fucking bid, you know, like invest some money in the industry and fucking, you know, you might move more issues, you know, or, or if it was OK, like they're 50 cents cheaper digitally. 
you know, a little bit of an incentive for you to do it or, you know, whatever it is, figure it out. I'm not the fucking guy in charge here. I shouldn't be tasked with figuring it out. You're, you have professionals in the industry. You should be able to figure out how you make it work because it like, to your point, Sean, it works in every other fucking industry. And granted the audience sizes are smaller, but that's your fault too. Like, I think that it, at some point you have to take responsibility as a company that like you're fucking up, you know, that you're not, you're not marketing your product well, because there's obviously interest in these characters. There's obviously more interest, I think, on a um, broad cultural level in comic books as a thing than there probably has been since the 90s, right? Since ever. Every so. every comic book character is more popular today than they ever were because there was more recognition. And yet that sure. has not translated at all into sales. That's psychotic. No. And and I think, you know, and again, maybe this is an outlier, maybe I'm talking out of my ass, but you know, I think that it doesn't have to be that way. Cause The Walking Dead isn't the best selling comic that Image puts out because it's The Walking Dead. It's because of the show. Because Walking Dead became a multimedia phenomenon and it translated into readers. And I don't think that that's a fluke. I think that that's a repeatable uh, thing if it's done right. And, you know, I just, I think they need to put more effort into thinking about the future of the industry, not how do we sustain the past. And I don't think that means you ignore physical sales. You ignore the local comic book store, but you have to be forward thinking. You have to be proactive, not reactive. Well, I I think the the Walking Dead multimedia situation that's a different conversation. I don't I don't think that's got that has to do with sales. Yes, but like uh, you know the direct market and the ar- archaic system of of comics ordering. That's a that's a different conversation. Then. Oh, I'm sorry. Just to clarify my point, I meant that you should be able to um, leverage the success of something as an IP, as a multimedia franchise, to make people more interested in the comic book. Sure. Not that it's a one-to-one thing, but the fact that Marvel has so much success with the films and it doesn't directly translate to sales for popular characters uh, is a failing on their part, in my mind. But it, to it's not capitalized. It's, it's that's the thing, man. Is that if you look in the books. They obviously want to look at the exiles as having the Tessa Thompson version of Valkyrie appear in the books, right? Yep. Who's that for? That shit ain't for me. Uh, the problem is that getting comics is hard. That's literally the problem. That's if it wasn't hard, then things like that would work, but they don't work and they never work because getting comics is hard. After you see uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 or whatever, now you're like, oh man, I love the Guardians. Where can I read more stories because they're so cool? And then that same day, you go to your comic book store and you buy Guardians of the Galaxy issue X and that particular issue sees a bump. The next month, do you still have that same hype around something you saw a month ago? No, you don't. So you don't take the the initiative to go to the store. That's It's simple. That's the way it works. And the fact that they haven't figured out a way to circumvent that problem proves to me that the people who work in these in this business are inept. They don't know what they're doing. They are not keeping up with the times. Well, and, and to your point, Sean, I also think it is the problem of that their strategy for it is to constantly reboot things and do new number one so that they are things that seem more approachable, but they're still not. Like, you can go pick up a Guardians book, but it's not a one-to-one thing. And, like, it, it, I don't think it's new reader friendly. And I don't think the way to do that is to make the comics less good by trying to constantly make them appeal to casual readers. You fucking find a way to sell them the graphic novel of number one of the first volume of, of Guardians. You know, you give them a natural jumping on point and you have to fucking draw that line for them. But even if, you, but, but, th- but again, man, like all that stuff is content. The content don't matter. The problem is that people can't get the book. That's, that's, that's it. They can't get it. If you, if you live in Oklahoma right now, you don't immediately know where your comic book store is at. But I bet you know where GameStop is. I bet you know where Barnes and Noble is. There's one in every fucking town. Yeah. People don't know where to get comics from. Even if you think Avengers is the greatest thing since sliced bread and you would be the kind of person who would latch on to comic books like nobody's business, the fact that you can't easily get the books is the biggest 
the biggest issue with actually developing a love for comics. It has nothing to, it has, I'm not going to say it has nothing to do. It has way less to do with what's actually taking place in the books because the books are good. The, the quality of comic books is not the problem. Comic no, books it's, are and good. It's, it's an exposure issue for sure. I think you're totally right. Um, and yeah, I think that, that people don't have the thought or the wherewithal that it is a straight line to your local shop or your Barnes and Noble or your Amazons or whatever it is to get that first taste. That's a problem. It's frustrating. But uh, I think we'll leave it there. I would love the the conversation around this to be uh, – I would love to hear from you guys. How did you first uh, develop a love for comics? Um, what's your local store like? How do they treat you and new readers when you when you walk in? Um, and what do you think about this issue? Do you think that uh, co- the comic book industry can be saved? Do you think that there are steps that can be taken to improve the industry? Or do you think that the comics industry is suffering from the fact that uh, books – are the, the same problem that books have, which is that reading is, is, is uh, especially reading physical things is a dying, dying art, I guess. And uh, do you think that the comics industry can circumvent that in any way? And you know what? Clap back, Diamond. What's good? <laughs> yeah. I would love to hear from someone from Diamond. Make a fucking app, you guys. It's like they don't want to make money. Uh, you can respond to uh, what I... Of course they don't want to make money. They sell comic books, Sean. <laughs> you can respond to what I've asked. Uh, in many ways, and also help us out by uh, hitting us up on iTunes. You can leave us a rating while you're there. Uh, we are on all other podcast hosting platforms, and of course, if we're not where you want us to be, let us know, and we will be. Uh, we are like Superman in the sense that if you call for us, we will come, because our hearing is excellent. Um, <laughs> we also have red underwear. That's right. Wait. <laughs> My Pete, check that out. <laughs> I don't. Wait, that's a visual gag. We can do it now. Hey, please get that checked out. I'm worried about you. <laughs> We are at the Comics Pals, wherever your social media is sold. We'd love to hear from you on there. Um, and, of course, that does include Facebook, uh, as Brian did write into us on there. And, uh, you know, we helped him out. So um, you can always hit us up on there. And, of course, uh, you can write to us at the Comics Pals at gmail.com, where we will read your random questions of the week, buy or sells, or your reactions to what we talked about on this or any other episode of the Comics Pals. And last but absolutely certainly not least is YouTube, where you can join the pals by hitting that subscribe button. You can like the video, comment, and share it with your friends. All that stuff helps us out a lot, so we'd really appreciate it. And uh, before I stop talking, uh, you should absolutely check out the Video Game Pals, which drops tomorrow, uh, and do the same things that we talked about for the comics pals, for the video game pals. Good show. Uh, and please check out all of our YouTube exclusive content, like our pals plays, the interviews that we've done at both Wizard World Philly and New York Comic Con, and uh, some other some other stuff like the behind the books history of the Defenders that we did on there. And if you're not subscribed, do so because there's a lot of new stuff that's going to be coming out really soon that you're going to want to stay uh, aware of. So with that, let's do some plugs. Pete, take it away. Cool. Thank you guys for joining us here on another episode of the Comics Pals. Uh, As Sean said, you can catch me and him on the Video Game Pals uh, tomorrow. If you're a gamer and you like this show, you'll probably like that one too. Um, We've also got the Return of the Riverdale review this week. Uh, I missed the episode, but Kale and Marco held down the fort, so we're very happy to uh, be back in the booth. Oh, well, Kale's a grouchy boy, so... Booth is standing. The fort, the fort's still there. Uh, <laughs> held down. I don't, I don't know about, but we got there. Right, we well, got there. In the I'll, end. I'll, I'll be back next week to, uh, to, to write that ship. So you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, like Sean said, please uh, go check out all the, all the other cool, cool stuff we're doing on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, give us a subscribe. That would be awesome. Uh, if you want to get some more content from me, I'm at loud underscore Pete on Twitter and Instagram. You can check out my writing over at CBR.com. Uh, I've got a new one coming out this week about um, celebrities with weird complaints about superhero movies. So it's, it's been a fun one to research. Um, so go check it out. Help me pay the rent. And uh, yeah, love you. <laughs> Kale? Oh. You can find my stuff with uh, Panels Publishing at uh, Panels Comics on selfie i say this shit every week. how do i know this and you don't yeah. yeah it's a selfie store yeah it's a selfie store <laughs> it's like selfie.com slash panels publishing or something uh we're on comiXology uh under panels comics it's fucking guy uh it's all 
all of that is digital. We do have an Etsy store where you can get uh, the con- the the stuff that we don't uh, end up selling at conventions. Uh, we will mail to you, so uh, please please uh, take advantage of that. Uh, you can find my stuff. On I was Twitter. gonna say. I'm sorry. I was going to say that Kale suffers from the same problem that the comics industry does and that he doesn't know how to promote his own books. <laughs> uh, but I fucking do, so... Just accept the roast. <laughs> I, no, because I sit here and promote I him every goddamn the week. roast. All right. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Toto in Tow. That's T-O-T-O-I-N-T-O-W. Awesome. Marco. You can find me... Uh, Mr. Marco Animoto on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, do I have an indie comic this week? I do not, but I have been. I started Transmetropolitan by Warren Ellis, uh, which has been interesting. So, uh, cool stuff. It's one of the essentials, they say. Go tweet at your boy about it. Yeah. Phil? All right, so I have to read this ad copy here. Hi, this is Phil Casey of the Comics Pals. Listen to my favorite show, Riverdale Review. I love this show so much because it discusses my favorite teen drama as they just figure out uh, where the romantic tensions lie. Listen to it every week. All right, that There was a lot of typos in that. Um, <laughs> and otherwise, just follow me on social media at Cyborg Bebop. There, was, there were typos in that, too. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and you can tweet and message me as often as you want. It doesn't mean I'll respond. And as for me, you can find me on Twitter only at Sean Soapbox, where I'm more than happy to talk to you about anything that we talked about on this or any other episode of the Comics Pals. Uh, but don't at me about Amalgam Comics because I don't give a shit what you think. Just message him about pirates. <laughs> Get the fuck out my mentions with that Amalgam <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we are the Comics Pal signing off. Take care, guys. <laughs> See you next week. Bye. There are, ty- there are typos in this whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>